in the like Fifth Orb Convention, something like that. I'll look that up. That'll be good. Well, I have a Hollywood MG. Used to belong to Darren McGavin. That's cool. Yeah. Well, One mile. We had a new couple joined the club, and they wanted to know who could who could they get to work on their MGTD because it had been in the barn for five or six years. Oh God. Nobody. Join the club oh. and you'd be amazed. And so the, over the weekend, the the guy's 84, the lady's 82, and she's like a 30-year-old with a new pony. Oh. We got that thing up and running, uh, put all new brake cylinders on it, uh, uh, cleaned out the carburetors, got it running good, and delivered it yesterday. And it was like Christmas in July. That was wow. more fun with that than I've had with my own MG. Oh. Someone else's car is all, always exciting. That's that's why I had so much fun for all those years in the shop, you know. So our club meetings tomorrow night. I, I gotta get mine out and make sure there's enough water in the radiator and oil in the engine. And I haven't driven it for a while. So well it's seven o'clock. It's time for us to ramp up and start going. So we got 61 on people, 61 people on board right now, but we'll see what it goes up to. Last time we just got over 100, I think maybe 105. So like that, Doug Clark is our unofficial official counter. Uh, he's, he's off and on. And, um, and he, he watches that number for me and tells me what it actually gets up to. So let me go over there for the couple of people who are new here. Um, this is our Zoom session, MG Technical Zoom. We'll start off with a with a uh, little talk about the, the MGB front suspension and then answer any questions having to do with that. And then we'll break into our chat. If you wanna pose a question, go over in the chat section, find that in the bottom of your toolbar and pose up a question and, and uh, we'll, we'll get to it when we get to it. Sometimes I get through all of them. Sometimes there's 20 of them left, you know, left wanting an answer. So if you need an answer, you know, just call me, you know, just call me tomorrow. And I'll, I'll do my best to pick up the phone and, and answer. I answer 99.999% of my phone calls. I don't answer so many of my um, emails. Those of you who emailed me know that. I, I do what I can. I also have a powerful button here. I have a mute all button. I've just pressed it so that we get rid of everybody's background noise. I'll press it occasionally as barking dogs and clanging fans and and um, um, granddaughters helping their grandpas get on and log on and stay on, um, keep that conversation away from the rest of us. If you want to cut in and say something, you can't raise your hand because I can't see everybody. So you just have to break in and you do that by unmuting yourself and speaking up or more easily depressing the space bar leaving it depressed while you speak. And then when you're done speaking, you let go of the space bar. How easy is that? And that way you can be on and off and not interfere with the rest of the conversation. So we always do the same kind of opening every time. Let me give you some numbers because they're always interesting. They're interesting to me. I sent out 5,723 notes on constant contact. 50% of those people who received the note opened it. Maybe they opened it and read one line. Maybe they peered at all those pictures and spent a long time with three people unsubscribed this week. I didn't look to see who or why. It's always content is no longer relevant to me. That's one of the options given. Um, so we always lose some. On YouTube, my YouTube views, my total YouTube views are at 9,886,000. So I only need another 120,000, 115,000 to go to hit 10 million. Then I'll be right up there with Britney Spears. YouTube, YouTube subscribers 
are sitting at 23,800. That's really nice. And of course, those numbers would be higher if I got my ass in gear and actually went out and made a couple of new videos. I saw my videographer the other night mowing, mowing his dad's lawn. So I'm sure he'd rather be shooting with his camera than, than uh, chasing a lawnmower. We have a Facebook page. I have a, a University Motors Facebook page. Uh, some of you log on to that from time to time, as do I. I don't answer a lot of the questions that are on there, but a lot of the questions do get answered by other people who are on there. So it's a very nice place just to pose, pose yet another question. So we will run this for two hours tonight. And the next time we get together will be Monday, the 25th of July. So over the past um, couple of weeks, I had I, I couldn't do the Zoom session at the end of end of June. I had one nominally scheduled, but I, I just couldn't get there. So since since I've been online last time, since we've all been together, I've been in. I went to Colorado Springs. I don't remember if that was before or after the the last one, but went to Colorado Springs to the Namgar meet, a GT47. That was well done, well organized, it was real nice. I got to drive up Pikes Peak. There were about a hundred cars in the uh, display, which was on asphalt. So it's always, it's always sad when it's on asphalt, but that often is the only kind of place you can find. So there were about a hundred MGAs, all different kinds, deluxes, twin cams, 1500 scoops, the works. Then I got home from that and I went to Peterborough, Ontario for MG 2022 which is the 30th anniversary of the original first American, uh, North American MG, oops, there's a technical call, sorry. Um, that was the, uh, the 30th anniversary of the first, the first North American MGB registers uh, series of, of meets. Uh, 30 years ago, I wasn't able to attend that one, but I, I was able to attend this one. Parking was cramped, to say the least, but the uh, display was, it was a nice venue for the display. A lot of things to do in Peterborough. I had a good time. We even had the, we even had the fire department in the hotel. I, I'm thinking, you know, kids, but none of us are kids, and we did overwhelm. We did take over the hotel, and sure enough, someone's air conditioner, uh, not someone, Kelvin Dodds from Moss Motors, had burst in the Freon or whatever they have in them today, was spewing all through his room, I guess, and all through the hallway, so that was about the only excitement of the time. A lot of really, really nice cars. Right at the end of the event, the show uh, one guy with a with a tf was able to drive on and couldn't get the thing started so by the time i got over there because someone came up and said oh this guy he's 83 years old and, and had driven up from virginia so he hadn't driven the car he towed the car on the trailer but he couldn't get it going again so i i went over and took a look at it and well he'd already um taken his Protronics unit out of his T-type distributor and was getting his second one. He, he knew enough to carry two, got that all in, put it back in, still no spark. He said, oh, I guess it's the coil. I said, wait, before, I mean, maybe it is the coil, but before you change the coil, let's do some, let's do some testing. So I, I got my set of tools and I got my test light. And we found that even though there was spark coming out of the coil, there was no spark coming out of the wire where it entered the center of the distributor cap. I mean, where can the spark go? But it must have burned, it must have burned an inch or so of the, uh, of the carbon up inside the wire. So we replaced, we shortened the wire. In fact, that was all we had to do. We just shortened the wire and presto, it started up again. So it's a reminder that you always diagnose the problem first as best you can. One way of diagnosing is to start throwing parts at it and keep adding more and more and more parts. And finally, you get the problem sorted out, of course, but sometimes you don't know why. And it's a lot cheaper. Sometimes it's longer, sometimes not, to define the problem first and go after the specific problem you've got. I worked on cars all day there. 
Uh, but I, I only worked on 20. I, I sometimes work on a few more than that, but I was by four o'clock in the afternoon. I pretty much had it started around eight, eight o'clock in the morning. From there, we drove, I drove to Ottawa, Ontario, and was a, a, a guest of the Ottawa uh, MG Club. And we had a um, shop hop on Friday. That was fun. We went to four different people's shops, looked at their cars, sat around every, every place that we went. They had uh, some soda or something or other, sweet rolls. Some, it was really nice. Got to look at machines, got to look at vehicles, not all of them MG. And uh, then on Saturday, a couple of weeks ago, then I went, uh, we did a, a complete tune up, tuned up a guy's car. So with about 30 people watching in about 100 degree temperature, it was really, really hot. So anyway, now, uh, and then between, between that and now, I went to Dayton, Ohio to the mini meet, uh, uh, the mini East meet. There were minis there. I'd never been to a mini meet before in my life, but I went there to do some technical. And it turned out it was pretty much the same as doing MG stuff. Everyone, a lot of silver, silver hair or no, gray hair, no hair. Um, a lot of older owners, from, but from all over with a passion for minis, with the t-shirts and the posters and, and uh, people with, with a really hot rotted up minis and people with old clapped out minis. It's the same as same as you'd find anywhere. So it's been a fun summer so far, and I'm now I get to be home for eight eight weeks, six weeks until Altoona, Pennsylvania, which is always a fun show. That's about their I don't know, must be their 26th, 27th show in Altoona, Pennsylvania, the Central Central Pennsylvania British Car Fest. And I've been to about 20 of them, so it's one of my regular regular stops. So it's always a fun MG summer. I'm finally going to get my own car out. I had it out a month ago. It's embarrassing to say, but I'm going to get it out tomorrow for our, our local club meeting. Anyway, so that's, that's, uh, that's what's going on there. I want to thank everyone who has contributed. I make my plea sometimes as infrequently as twice. Sometimes I remember to do it as many as four times. But if you find this session helpful, if you want to be nice and kind and generous, you can go to my website, universitymotorsltd.com, and find the yellow PayPal button. It's not hard to find. It's right there with a catchy little phrase that says something like, help John afford his retirement. You can press the PayPal button and, and offer me some of your hard-earned cash for, for the entertainment value that you get here, the, the technical knowledge that you get here, and to help me cover my expenses because it's I do have... I do have expenses with constant contact and PayPal and my insurance man. <laughs> Go figure. These are the people who contributed since last time, as of about two o'clock this afternoon. So we, we have Tom Banks, Diana Cunningham. Now it's not Diana, it's her husband. I can't remember his name. Phil Russo, Jean DeCarly, Henry Morgan, Mark McCann. Otmar Rinkin, Les Fengson from Phoenix, Tom Gallagher, Doug Clark, our official counter, David Basili, Phil Kalura, Pilgrim Hill Studio, thank you, Pilgrim Hill Studio, uh, Bobo Tanner, Roberta Johnson, John Renaud, Dave Smittle, who had his Y-Type at MG 2022. Really cool car. We've done that car at University Motors, I don't know, 1987 maybe. Still running reasonably okay. Peter McCarthy, John Uhas, Dave Massey, Alan Vinegar. Alan um, organized a, a, a rebuild session, an engine rebuild session at MG 2022. And I was the presenter for that uh, with all kinds of comments about what to do and how to rebuild your engine. James Riley, Quentin Reeder, Greg Fisher, Doug Clark's come up again. 
Kurt Johnson, James Simino, Ben Andrews, Alan Batchelder, Gary Martin, Craig Urish, Dean Wheeler, whose doors I adjusted at GT47 on an MGA successfully, surprisingly, Roger Zierman, Patrick Hogan, Doc Rosevere, June Arricchio, probably not Joan, it's probably whoever else is in charge of the checkbook, Daniel Chasens, Glenn Craig, Steve Jowin. So that's, that's uh, Gitano Giordano. So anyway, thank you all, all of you who've made contributions on my behalf. I really, truly do appreciate it. So tonight, I wanna to talk about MGB front suspensions. It'll be quick, I've got some demonstrations. I'm gonna stand back. Um, if you can't hear me, somebody break in and say, hey, we can't hear you, but I'll speak up and try to make sure that you can hear everything I've got to say, but I don't have an external camera, which I should get for, for Q&A or for this kind of demonstration. And that's one of the reasons I haven't got my backdrop behind me. Uh, I, I've got this nice backdrop that's very kind um, to be provided to me, and I don't use it because I don't have a green screen behind me yet. Maybe someday I'll get it. So the bottom end of, well, no, let's stop, start with the top end. The top end of the MGB front suspension is made up of, of a shock absorber, and not the kind of shock absorber that you see that's on every other car in the world, but this thing here. That's that's um, uh, this this is without without its arms showing the chambers inside, and there's a valve that fits right down right down in here, and as the shock moves up and down, the arms of the shock move up and down, it forces fluid from one cylinder into the other cylinder. And it does that through the valve. The compression stroke going up is stiffer than the rebound stroke coming down. The reason that you may not be able to rebuild this yourself, I mean, I'm a, I'm a firm believer in rebuilding everything, but I've never rebuilt a shock because it's just so difficult to, to get apart. But here are, the, here are the pistons. You can see these pistons here. One of them is just a solid piston up on top, but the other one has a big rubber seal on it. That's, that's for the, uh, the compression stroke. So as, as this guy is, is working up, uh, it's really hard to show this, but as this guy's working up, up and down, the uh, the pistons the pistons move back back and forth and push that hydraulic uh, that hydraulic oil from one cylinder into another. So what goes wrong with these shocks? Because that's what we're talking about is, is maintenance and repair. The bushings go bad out here on, on the end, and then oil starts to leak out of here, and then the oil level gets down too low, and the pistons are just pushing air. They're no longer pushing fluid. That doesn't happen with the rear shocks because the rear shocks are built like this with the cylinders, the operational cylinders at the bottom. So even though it might leak down to the axle point, there's still enough fluid in here to, to work. The arms will get real loose, not very often, but they'll, they'll get loose. So up here, the only thing that ever goes wrong is it starts to leak. Once it starts to leak, then the, then the shocks get bouncy. And when they get bouncy, then the, the wear accelerates. So you can buy brand new shocks. I think you still can. Um, they're very, very expensive. You can have your old shocks rebuilt. I send my shocks to Peter Caldwell at Worldwide Imports in Madison, Wisconsin. They've got an exchange program. You can send them an MGB. You can order an MGB shock and get one uh, with a, that comes in a box with a shipping label, the whole works. So they get the, the old shock back. You can't do that with MGAs or T-types. You have to send your shocks in and get your shocks rebuilt. Apple Hydraulics also rebuild shocks out of New York. So this is pretty straightforward. You know, it's a, you can say it's, it's old and antiquated and everything, but geez, it works. You know, and it's not unlike a, um, the device that 
that uh, closes a heavy commercial door, the big, the big uh, hydraulic deal at the top. When you're servicing this car, this shock, there's this bolt up here at the top. It's one of the only British threads left in the car. And it's a 516 PSF size, but a 13 millimeter fit, uh, fits it. So you can unscrew this, unscrew this, this nut and put the end of an uh, oil can, a dedicated oil can through there, because inside that dedicated can is hydraulic oil. You go to a motorcycle shop and get the heaviest weight hydraulic oil you can and, and go ahead and fill it up. It doesn't have to be off the ground. You don't have to exercise anything. You know, yet you don't have to set a timer, nothing. Just take this thing out, squirt it. We use, a, um, I still have one, a, an oil can with a little bit of flex rubber on the end and then a little piece of 3 16 tubing on the end of that. And I just hook it into the inside of here and pull the trigger, glug, 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 until the fluid spits out. And then you go ahead and, and um, put the nut back in or the, the bolt back in. And that, that, that takes care of it. So that's a pretty easy explanation. If it's broken, you have to you have, to have it rebuilt. So now we'll talk about the bottom end, which is the A-arms. So here's the, here's the A-arm assembly. So everyone, you know, you're familiar with this. Coil spring sits on top. There's a little, little hole right here at the bottom so that water can, water can get out uh, when it's in the, um, and you get water in there. That that hole, of course, plugs up after after a while with silt and so forth. Make sure that that stays open, uh, so that whatever whatever water does get trapped in there doesn't rust away the bottom of the pan. This guy was uh, invented by Alec Isagonis. It was used, I think, on the YT. First of all, it's a, a real good system. This one does not have a sway bar attached to it, front or back. Uh, that was added on. That was an option uh, that, that came up uh, during the very late MGAs. And it was fitted to almost all MGBs, not 74 and a half through 76 sometimes. You just you never know for sure. Uh, it's the single most impressive thing you can do with front suspension handling is to put a, a sway bar on the car, it's really easy. Everything's there, just waiting for you to, to do it. Well, it's not totally easy, you gotta take the A-arms off. As long as you're taking the A-arms off, you might as well change the A-arm bushings and you know you get a lot of mission creep here. So not much goes wrong with this because it's so heavy and durable, but things do. If you've been in a collision, look at this. Hmm? This is pretty impressive. The, this thing was so uh, got got pretty bent in some some kind of collision. Out at the end of the A arm, there's a distance tube. And that distance tube is fixed out on the out on the end of, end of this arm, and as as the car goes up up and down. Um, as, the, as the car goes up and down, and the kingpin, the kingpin has to move here, and it's it's it has to swivel, and so it, it always it always has to be able to to swivel on the distance tube. Over a period of time, the distance tube gets um, frozen to the, to the bolt, like this one. The distance tube is frozen, and then you end up with this with this. Uh, wear on the bolt because instead of the instead of the distance tube um, being fixed it turns out that the, the distance tube is is stuck in the bottom of the kingpin and the a-arm has to move up and down instead and that wreaks havoc with the with the bolt and puts a, i'm trying to find get a good uh, perspective here and, and you get a real cutaway on the on the bolt it usually doesn't cause any trouble, 
because even though the hole can get elongated, the head of the bolt ends up hitting the, the top of the A-arm and it usually, usually doesn't cause a problem. And I wanna say only once in 50, 50 years of doing this that I have one that was actually torn out. So this is very, very uncommon. But you have, you have to work with the bottom of the kingpin so that you have to keep it lubed. So here's the MGB kingpin. It's really, it's a durable piece. It's a long shaft, you know, which is foot long almost. And here at the bottom is, is where that distance tube fits. So this, this thing can actually, this stays in the same place, right? Because the wheel never goes up and down. It's only the car that's moving up and down uh, here at the top or the A-arms here at the bottom moving. But for demonstration, we'll say that this goes up, up and down. So it's a long kingpin. It wears at the bottom right down here in 1960, when the first MGs came out, MGBs, they didn't have a grease cirque here at the bottom. Uh, there are three grease cirques all together, one at the top, one at the top up, up here, one down here, and one at, at, the, very, at the very base. So they only had two and that wasn't enough and three isn't enough either, because uh, grease always takes the path of least resistance. So you can end up with a lot of wear down here um, and uh, the kingpins can start to wobble. You're holding this firm and you're, you're moving this guy back and forth. And I can feel even on, on this one, there's a little bit of free play, but it doesn't hurt anything. And it's a lot better, this guy, this setup is a whole lot better than the earlier style, which was the MGA style. This one had an exposed, an exposed kingpin. It's threaded and they're always bent. You can see that this one's bent. If I hold it up here, you can see that, that uh, the, the bottom here is, is bent, bent on, an, on an angle. So they, they uh, you hold them straight, straight ahead. I don't know if you can see, but it's, uh, these guys are on T-types and MGAs. They're just bent all the time. So they're really weak compared to the MGB. The MGB kingpin is just the nuts. I didn't, uh, I showed the picture. It's probably the picture of these, but uh, your, your uh, coil springs can and will fracture. It's very unusual but they can and will fracture if there's a whole lot of shaking going on. So that's what the shock is designed to do is to dampen the harmonic motion of the front suspension. Then we have the kingpin assembly and the kingpin assembly is just tremendous. You've got a nut here on the end, which is always a right-hand nut on the T-types and MGAs. The left side of the car has a left-hand nut. We've got a tagged washer. It's got a tag in it, so it can't spin. An outer wheel bearing. Shims, which are not in this assembly. I don't know where they are. They used to have them in here, but there's shims that go on top of this guy. This is a distance piece. We've got an inner bearing. The inner bearing never goes dry. Doesn't matter how, how long it's been since it's been greased. If you just grease the outer bearing, the grease from the outer bearing will, will migrate in and, and grease the inner bearing. And then you've got a distance piece here because the kingpin has a radius, has a radius here that, that um, makes it strong. If it just came down and was an angle, just a, a 90 degree angle, it would break off. So with, by putting a radius in there, then you have a, a chamfered edge on the inside of that. This guy goes goes on. So it works out very, very nicely. And if you put the hub on and the right, the right uh, distance pieces, you tighten this guy down all the way tight. So he's under uh, 60, 60 pounds or more. Um, 
then then uh, you you end up with three thousands two three thousands of end flow, which means the the hub can move in or out two or three thousands. Um, if you're setting it up in oil, you can feel it. If you're setting it up with grease, you can't feel the tunk. If you use a dial indicator, you can put the dial indicator on the on the flat face of the hub and put the put the probe on the center and then move the hub in and out to get the three thousands. It's a whole lot better assembly than the T-type, which is almost the same. We've got a, we've got a nut here. We've got a, a reverse thread nut. And we've got roller bearings, roller bearings, not, uh, not taper bearings. But it's still the same setup, still an inner bearing. In the distance to no shims, there's a roller bearings. And the nut tightens in the direction of wheel rotation. So that if something goes wrong, the nut, the nut gets tighter rather than looser. So when you take the whole thing apart, it's, it can be a real task. Sometimes you've got to get stuff really, really hot. And that means an oxyacetylene torch. There's some things on the car that can be very difficult to do. Exhaust, just because it doesn't fit. And how do you make it fit? You got to heat it up with an oxyacetylene torch to bend it to make it fit. Um, the leaf springs, uh, the front bolt on the leaf springs can be stuck and you got to get a sawzall out, cut that off to, to get it apart. And then the front suspension, and there's lots of stuff on the front suspension that, that can get um, really rusty and not want to come apart. In that kingpin assembly, Getting the top nut off the kingpin assembly up here, oh, that's easy, but getting the trunnion, this top trunnion off, off the kingpin is all but impossible unless you've got a really good press, an oxy-settling torch, and some special tools. So best thing there is to buy a set that's already, already done by somebody else and already shimmed and reamed and all set to go. So that's that's just my my quick uh, quick course on on how this works. Lubrication is always the same. You you fill it with grease as often as you've got the front end of the car up. Just keep pumping it with grease. That's all all you can do. And grease the outer wheel bearings. You don't have to take the whole hub off. Just grease that outer wheel bearing from time to time, once every ten thousand miles, which means probably once every ten years, um, judging by how much some of us drive our cars. But it's the outer wheel bearing that needs to, to be greased and make sure that you've got the right number of shims. So when you do torque it up to tight, really tight, 60, 80, 100 pounds, that the front hub still spins. And if it's got grease on it, it'll spin. But if you grab a hold of it and push it in and out of the car, it does not tunk. You cannot feel a tunk. If you feel a tunk, there's too much, there's too much end flow. You got to take some shims out. On the other hand, if you tighten it up and the front hub, the front hub freezes, you've got to add shims. The shims, you can look in the Moss catalog, but the shims come at 35, 10, 5, and 3. And you just have to use the right combination. Getting there can be a real task, especially with wire wheels. I just did that last week on a car. Um, with wire wheels, it's just it's, it's tedious. Got to keep fishing down inside there with some 90 degree scribes, dental tools to pull those shims in and out. Uh, a disc wheel, disc wheel hub's a whole lot easier. So anyway, th that's my my comments about front suspension. And uh, if someone's got some comments, uh, we'll talk about front suspension. Rich Winslow, if you're on, you can talk about uh, John, negative camera. John yeah. Bruce McMillan. Yes. Who are you answering to? Not, not, uh, I'm not married. So I only answer to myself. No, I'm kidding. Um, Bruce, I'm talking to you. Good. Uh, I'm the number two original case of a breakup of the distance tube bolt and the A-arm. 
uh, 50 miles an hour, getting into a left-hand curve on the Washington, uh, Southwest Washington Freeway. This. Yes. Guess what? It, right, <clears throat> front right passenger tire kicked out, dropped down, skidded off, and <clears throat> there's a nice wide margin. And the tow truck was right behind me. So uh, <clears throat> the whole right side front suspension is uh, trashed. Uh, took it up to my new home. They wouldn't let me park it there. So I took it, blah, blah. Bottom line is, please do check that because I have a had a 77 and popped it open just on account of I've been there, done that. You got to watch those A-arm uh, ovals out. <clears throat> Only a cautionary note. Yes, nothing quite like an inspection. Nothing like dropping your right front tire down and riding the body down. Oh boy, and, and you, you help me out, but you, you lose your steering too, right? Yeah, but you can, you know, on the left-hand side, you can sort of crank the steering okay. and ride the whole axle on your right side. Oh, what, what Bruce is talking about is if you take a look underneath your car, the bolt, the bolt should be um, centered. It should, should be centered in the AR, AR, but if you find that it's moved like way up, that's because it's elongated. So it should be it, that and the nut should sit right in the center. You know, so anyway, oh my gosh. All I can oh, say man. is uh, advice given. There's a lot of other stuff too. There's, there are four bolts that hold that shock in place. Those bolts come loose. Who would, who would guess? You say you need a deep 916 socket and a ratchet and tighten them up. But I did have a customer whose shock came off at speed. And the, because of, um, I don't know, centrifugal force, what, what, I'm not an engineer. The wheel stayed basically upright while he was driving. But somebody drove up next to him and they're pointing at his left front wheel. And he said he turned, he turned the car um, onto the shoulder. And when the car came to rest, the wheel the wheel flop, you know, with the shock and, and the brake line, it was an earlier car. So you can, it tears the brake line off and then you don't have any brakes. So yeah, creepy. John, yes. uh, I know this is MGBs, but you, you showed that Kingpin on the TD and I think you said it's also on the MGA. What are the symptoms of that bent uh, Kingpin I mean, I've got both cars and I hope neither one of them are bent, but how would I know without taking it apart? Yeah, it doesn't evidence, I'm sure it, cha it changes that, you know, there, you got the three functions, right? You got <clears throat> caster, camber, and you got caster, you know, caster, camber, and toe in. So right. it changes, it change, but if there's a bend there, it changes the camber on one side. And if you're interested in knowing what the camber is, after, after having moved the car at least, 10 feet forward, you can take your uh, carpenter square and just abut it to the bottom of the tire and look to see how much, you know, how much um, deflection there, th there is and, and check the other side, just make sure that they're pretty much the same. Okay. On, on an MGA, on the one that I had in my hand, which is, here, that one's, um, I don't know if I can get this in the right. Yeah, we can place. see it. You, you can see it? Yeah. Okay. Um, it's, it's, uh, it's absolutely not straight. And if you look critically, you know, you've got the, got the MGA jacked up and you look critically at that line and you go, you know, it looks like it's better than it probably is. Mm -hmm. But as far as driving the car and handling, I'm not sure. I'm not sure you'd notice anything, you know, out on the track. Maybe the, that's a whole different set. Rich Winslow, if you're on, you can talk about the negative camber A arms. I'll, I'll get off in a minute, but uh, to follow up on Bruce, I had a TR4, and it was a rust problem, but the lower A arm broke off the chassis, and that's no fun either. And I think it's a similar arrangement. Um, um, thank you, John. I'm off. Hey, okay. All right. 
So we, do we have any other comments or notes about, about A-arms? A-arms or kingpins or shocks or MGB front suspension? John? Yes. David Massey here. David, yeah. Somebody converted my uh, front end on an A to B front end uh, so they could get the uh, brakes. And uh, how common is that? Um, and is it a... I think they had the, the the wheel well looks like it's been cut a little bit because of for space, but they may have done it poorly anyway. But if you would comment on that, please. Sure. Well, the shock the shock is the same. The A arms are the same. Now the width of the shock in the front changes. A B is very narrow. I mean, between the the two shocks, because there's only some rubber bushings that go in there. And the T-type and the MGA shock are, are, have got a gap about that big um, for the distance tube, because there's a distance tube top and bottom. So what you end up doing is using shims, usually. Uh, you, if you've got the MGA shock, you can use shims. So you can, you can buy a shock, especially for that application. Why can't you use an MGB shock? Because the MGA has studs in the wheel, in the, on the frame. And there's a problem with the getting the B on, getting the B something. There's a problem getting the B shocks on there. Um, the, I don't know, the height, something or other. So it's real common to find the MGA shocks still on there. And then um, other than that, the, the other thing that causes a problem is the, is the, steering, the steering arm where it comes out from the kingpin and, and attaches to the outer tie rod end, that's got a different angle to it. So the overall width for the rack and pinion is, uh, is narrower and you've got you've to cut new threads on the rack and pinion, which is really hard to do because the tie rods are extremely um, hard. So you end up wrecking a die or two. To cut, and you don't have to have very many more threads. You're going to have some more threads on it, but it's a completely acceptable thing to do. The, you know, that it's the it's the same suspension from 1949 all the way up through 1980, and all that stuff works back and forth. Um, so it's it's a wonderful thing to do. Do you have a, a sway bar on your car, David? Got to mute. Yes, I had it. I had it. Just these. That's the that's the single most dramatic thing you can do. To it's made by Adco down in Florida here. Okay. All right. So you didn't use a factory one. You you got an add on. Yeah. Okay. Yeah. My my first car was a seventy six B, and it was one without a sway bar, <laughs> and I went and got one from a from a wrecking yard. And you're right. It, I mean. You have to change the A arm so it'll go in, but the in the frame, the 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 holes were there, threaded. I mean, it's a bolt right on. Bolts right what, on. what a difference! Yeah, yeah. I just can't. I just can't say. And you can fit that. You it's uh, the the width is the same. You can take an MGB uh, uh, anti sway bar uh, and fit it to a T type to an MGA. It just, it's all that stuff is so wonderfully interchangeable. T-type, you got to mount it lower on the dumb irons, the MGA. You're supposed to mount it above that web assembly that comes out away from the rack and pinion and holds the front bumper. Paul Deershaw at Sports Car Craftsman, God, I use his name a lot, uh, in, in, Colorado, in Denver, Arvada, Colorado, can rework your... Uh, web assembly, spider assembly, whatever you want to call it, that is on your MGA to accept the sway bar. You've got to drop that whole thing off anyway to properly mount the sway bar. So, but it's such a dramatic, nice, nice improvement. Really is. John, I have a, I have a problem on uh, front suspension. Uh, my car tracks well. We did the tow in ourselves, then we took it to a shop, and they told me. It was probably hit because the right side is maybe a quarter inch farther back than the left side. And the, the, the tire is just a little bit out, but um, it tracks well. I don't wear out tires. 
and I can't visibly see anything that's bent. What what would be the most likely thing that's bent to make it? Well, you, what you mean is the distance from the center of the wheels, left and right, front and rear, are different. Yeah, the the right just, front is a quarter inch farther back. Just it's it's you'd find a, a wrinkle, a ripple in the frame, somewhere between the cross member and where it enters the the uh, the, the main body structure, right at the rear of the wheel arch. Okay. It'd be uh, it'd be someplace in there, but then. You know, all these it runs okay. I, I don't really have a problem with it. Then, you know, I mean, if, if it's tracking well and all that kind of stuff, then there's no point in getting excited about it. The other thing you mentioned, uh, ADCO sway bars. Yes. You've got one in the front, one in the back. And uh, 30 some years I've had it, and the brackets in the back broke. And uh, so I called ADCO to see if I could just buy the brackets. and. He said, you have a sail slip? I said, 30 years. I don't have a slip. He said, well, no problem. He said, we make two different styles. I'll send them both to you. No charge. Oh, very so nice. Stand behind their products. I have, a, I probably have too much sway bar. I got 15 sixteenths in the front and three quarter in the back. That's, Boy, does it stay flat. Yeah, I bet it right really. Start. Well, that's, you know, people say, oh, I want to get these really stiff bushings in the A-arms. You know, the, the original, the original, Air bushings that go up up in here are just dreadful. <laughs> they pop out, they're awful. And so you can get black ones, you can get red ones, and people say, oh, you know, I want it stiff. And it's like there's a reason that it's rubber. And the reason is to isolate you a little bit, a little bit from, from the road. I'm gonna hit mute all because I got some background noise here. I don't know from where. And uh, um, anyway, I mean, if you're if you're going for gold, I mean, just put some put some uh, needle bearings in there, you know, then you really feel the road. So there's there's a reason for having that stuff in there, and and there's a reason for the the sway bars being the size that, that they are. But if you're you know again, you know, if you're happy with the way your car handles and you get used to the way it handles, that's great. You know, so seventy four and a half through. 76s man when you, when you go around a corner and you start to turn you know they just they they just roll away from the turn it's just dramatic and all mgas do that all t-types do it you put a sway bar on it it's like a brand new suspension John, John, greg yeah uh john regarding bushes the uh the factory MGB stuff I've had my experience with them is that they're junk are the uh, V8 bushes still a pretty good yes yep that's still a rubber that's still a rubber bushing those are still nice you can squeeze those in uh, put a little bit of, of uh, I usually just use grease which is probably bad because it probably causes the rubber to fail but you can use sil glide on them too or Vaseline or something and and uh, push them push them through the a arms with uh, a socket pair of sockets in a vice just squeeze them through there it's really easy they still have a steel center to them unlike the original ones the v8 bushings so that's someplace you should use anti seeds so that you can get them off the off the uh, fulcrum pin next time John, could you comment on what we should use um, with poly bushings? Well, the poly bushings come with, with, with some uh, stuff that looks like Vaseline. And is it? I don't know. I, when I run out of it, I just use Silglide. Sometimes it doesn't. The stuff's it, it, the little tiny, tiny tube that comes with it. Um, really is enough as it turns out. But if you if you use too much of it and run out of it, um, Napa sells, I, a lot of other people do too, this stuff called Silglide and it's some sort of silicon based. It's just to keep it from squeaking. It's all oh boy, sometimes when you put those in without with that lube and you hit the front end of the car and it goes ee, 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 ee. It's like, it's not, it's not fun to drive the car. Hey, John, can you speak to um, 
tube shock conversion as opposed to the lever shock and rebuilding the front rear? Don't, don't do it. <laughs> I mean, I, I've seen them and, and the, the, the ones in the front, my experience with them is that they, they're ill-fitting. I had one that broke. Guy came in for some service and uh, we, we didn't, I, he did not come in for front suspension service. We didn't notice that the bolts holding all these brackets on had come loose. He was in a parking lot and the shock came loose and the end of it was dancing around and pushed up and tore his front brake hose off. So he lost his front brakes. So I'm, I'm not, I'm not keen. I'm not keen on those tube shock conversions at, at all. I just, I don't see the advantage. Uh, you know, you want, you, you want better, you want stiffer shocks, then send them off to Peter Caldwell and tell him you want them stiffer. Um, you want them, you want them lighter. You can make them lighter. You can get adjustable valves even to fit in them. I don't know if you can find those anymore, but um, it's a, it's a, the system, the system's perfectly excellent. There's no, no need to put SPAC shocks on it or tube type shocks. Um, it's, it's homemade engineering. So that I just, I'm, I'm really, I'm pretty violently opposed to them in the front end. I see them a lot more in the rear end where you take the plates off the, off the leaf springs and, and um, switch them side to side and turn them upside down so the shock fits. But again, I don't see the point of it. Um, the dampers that are in back work just fine and they hardly ever go bad. And if they do, you just buy another one. I don't, I don't get it. I don't know why you, I don't, I mean, I, I racing, you know, you're out on the course, you want different handling, um, characteristics that that's beyond my, beyond my expertise. I, I, I just do the, for all those years, I, I just was preparing cars to go out and drive on the street. So. Well, you do coilovers for racing, I think, as opposed to just shock conversion. But <laughs> well, there's yeah, there's a there's a bunch of different front suspensions. Uh, I know maybe three of them, uh, three or four of them. You know, you can spend three, four, five thousand bucks on a, on another suspension for your MGB, and at that at that point, you're you know you can buy a Miata. You know, so <laughs> I don't I. I there's always improvements. I mean, there's always possibilities of, of, of improvements, and there are and there are a arms that are are shorter and provide a negative camber or something for the for um, for out on the racetrack. And people do do that, but again, we're out we're outside of my expertise on that. Thanks, John. Yeah. Any more comments about shocks or a arms or? Sure, John, if I may, Doug um, So I was getting a clunk from the front end of the MGB sort of out, upon stopping. You could hear a, a movement. One year? 67. Okay. Wire wheels or disc wheels? Wire. Okay, so the, the, first, the first possibility is that the wire wheels actually lose, right? So you jack up the front end, your buddy puts his foot on the brakes, and that, that then the brake rotor doesn't move and you grab the wheel and you turn it. That will turn. It will, it is independent. It is free of the of the splines. Questions how much compared to the other the other three in the car. That's a possibility, but more likely, more likely, we're back to our distance tube. Let me get my props. Even though the camera doesn't support itself. The bottom of the, you know, the bottom of the of the kingpin fits around this distance tube and the bottom of the kingpin has to be narrower than the length of this distance tube so that it, it, it can swivel around it as the, as the car bobs up, up and down. There are um, shims at the end here, washers, and you can end up with some end float at the bottom, at the bottom here on your kingpin so that when the car comes to stop, oh, this stops because this has got the wheel and the brakes in it. This stops, but on the bottom, the, a the, the car continues to move another 16th of an inch and hits this. And you get this really low thunk, 
right at right at the very very end of breaking. Is that what you're describing? That's what I'm describing. I, yeah. I thought I tightened everything up, like the shock and everything. But and let me take that, a look uh, there. Is is the uh, is the front end brand new? The front end. Yeah, I pretty much pulled the whole front end apart and rebuilt it. I checked the A-arm because I was thinking maybe I was getting that wear that you had indicated earlier. Um, I was able to suppress it a, a bit by tightening the, the trunnion bolt on the top, which was the, the discussion point I'd like to have with you. How tight do you make that trunnion? But the, the clunk came back. Okay. Well, it's almost always, it's either the wire wheel or it's, it's this distance to and and if you're if you're setting it if you're setting up your car and you've got this distance tube in your hand, you put that through the bottom of the of the kingpin assembly, and you make sure that the distance tube is only 10 to 12 thousandths longer than the bottom of the kingpin. Because if it's too long then it'll bang, bang around up, right? I, here, I, I gotta hold this thing up upside down, but that distance tube, that distance tube can't be a whole lot longer than this, or this is gonna move back and forth on the distance tube between the ends of the A arm. And it's that, which is happening, me. I gotta, I gotta hit the, uh, I gotta use my mute all button again. We get some background noise here. There we go. All right. So anyway, Doug. So that it, it's either one of those two things. So feel the feel the wheels first. You know, you can you can check those individually, and and of course the rear ones are are usually worn more, uh, and the ones on the right hand side are usually worn more. They they turn more. And to, to take care of that is only, I don't know, 600 bucks a corner I mean, or something horrible. I mean, you gotta buy a wheel, <laughs> you gotta buy a wheel and you gotta buy the hub. So it, it's, it's uh... Well, this is interesting because one of my questions in the chat, you've already answered, I'm having the same problem in the rear. When the emergency brake, I can rotate the wheel. So my, my, I was hoping you could tell me which I have to buy, but it sounds like I gotta buy both. The hub <laughs> and the wheel. They're both worn. Yes, they wear together. So you can check the diameter of the hub with a, with a pair of calipers, write down this number, 2.450. That's the width of the splines. Now, some people say, look at the splines and are they sharp or are they curved or just put a pair of calipers on them and me measure, the, measure the, the overall width. And it should be 2.450 inches. It's actually a metric, but or in inches here in this program. So once it gets to 440, it's starting to get worn. 230, that's pretty worn. Uh, 220, that's horrible. At 390, at 390, the wheel will actually spin loose from the from the hub. So yeah, okay. another horror story on that same 76 MGB. I had wire wheels originally, and that happened to me uh, driving to work. And you step on the brake, I stepped on the brake and I hear this horrible racket. Yeah, I was like, what is that? And I was turning into the parking lot at my at where I work. And of course, when it locked up, it was on the left-hand side and it walked, the wheel kept spinning. So it walked the nut off the end of the hub. And when I turned into the parking lot, the wheel just came off and it fell right on the rotor. It was, it was not not pretty. So and you're still the reason to not have wire wheels. <laughs> and I, and and I I, re I replaced the hub and the wire wheel, got it all going, and then a couple of years later, I had the same problem with the back. You know, you let off the clutch and it wasn't going anywhere, and it's like, oh, it's just spinning in there. And that's the point where I switched to switched to steel wheels. It was okay. like. It's like the wires look great and they're very nostalgic and all of that. But for a, at the time, that was an everyday driver and it was, they were just too much of a hassle. And steel wheels are lighter. They're lighter yeah. than wire wheels. That's why between the TC and the TD, 
1949 to 1950, they went to steel wheels because they were lighter. They handled better. And, yeah. everybody, you know, and for three years, people said, oh, we want those wire wheels. We want the classic look. So they, and, they, and you go to a tire shop, you call them first to say, and this is back when they were still making MGs. This is, you know, 79, 80. And you say, hey, can you work on a center lock wire wheel? Oh, absolutely. And you take it and they put it up on the rack and the guy asks you, he goes, how do you get this thing off? And it's like, okay, <laughs> just put it down, <laughs> you know. Yeah, yeah. So the, today, the place to get your wire wheels sorted out are motorcycle shops. Yeah. They've got the talcum powder. They've got the tubes. They've done it three times already today. <laughs> so, yeah. 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 My shop said, yeah, I'll, I'll balance them up to about 175 miles an hour. And so, you know, you really don't need to. You know, you shouldn't, you shouldn't be balancing a motorcycle wheel up that high either. But, um, but they'll, at least they're, they're very used to it. If you want to take the front cross member off the MGB to change the pads between the cross member and the, and the body, because uh, they're shot, they're worn out, and they need to be changed. Or if you're putting in the um, caster shims, right now, there's a, there's a, a, a you know, your, your, your front, this is the bottom of your front wheel. This is exaggerated, but it's um, the, the wheel is it, the front. The, the wheel doesn't turn vertically. It, it turns. It turns on an angle. And the advantage of this is that you can the car tracks better. You know, you think of those motorcycles with the front wheel that's two miles out in front of the driver, and they they can take their hands off the off the handlebars, and it still tracks. Still tracks in a nice straight line. And that was necessary with. Um, bias block tires. But with radial tires, you don't need as much caster. So you can straighten it out. Why would you even worry about it? Well, because the more angled it is, the more the car actually moves up and down when you turn the steering wheel. So the, the effort that you've got turning the wheel isn't just turning the wheels, it's actually lifting the car up, up in the air. That's why, it's, you know, you're yeah, you're lifting the car. So, so if you've got this inclination here uh, and you straighten it out a little bit, then that's okay with the radial tires that we have now. But then you have to uh, reshim the rack and pinion and changing those, those pads, if you're going to change them all together, requires that you remove the coil springs so you can reach up inside the cross member and hold the, the bottom of the stud that holds it to the to the vehicle. So it's a big project. John, could you, uh, am I correct that uh, I'd love to get rid of the wire wheels on my 72 MGB and go back to the stock wheels because I think they're beautiful. But I've been told that it, you have to have whole new axles and everything. On my Triumph, I just pulled off the uh, wire wheels, put the uh, yep. studs back on and drove it, but I didn't know what I was doing anyway. The, 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 Triumph, the Triumph is like that. They've got add-on, um, you know, they, they show, they show uh, in the workshop manual, they show a guy with a hacksaw shortening, the, shortening the, the lug nuts, I don't know, to put a wire wheel flange on instead of disc wheels or something. So the problem is that the offset on the wheels is such that it demands that the wire wheel differential is three quarters of an inch narrower on each side, inch and a half overall. And, and it brings it in. So if you just take, if you take your hubs off and put um, disc wheel hubs on, okay, then the inside of the wheel, the inside of the wheel is gonna rub the, the, the inside of the wheel arch. The corollary is true. And that is you wanna put wire wheels on a disc wheel car, so you just put the wire wheel hubs on, now it pushes the wheels out. And now the outside of the wheel is rubbing, uh, rubbing just on, on the inside of the, of the outer wheel arch. So Can unless you you've got a 70, 74 and a half through 80 and, and the suspensions is jacked up high enough and the wheels are narrow enough. Could you use a spacer? Uh, if you were going from wire to 
uh, steel wheels. Could, yes. So I, I guess the studs aren't long enough. Correct. You can get, a, I did that on my daughter's car. I, I got, I got long studs and I got, a, I made or had made two three quarter inch spacers and, and uh, put, put the whole thing on. You can buy spacers. You can't buy a three quarter inch spacer. You can buy three eighths and you get two of those or, and they, they're generic. So they'll fit four log, five log, you know, all kinds of, all kinds of stuff. And, and they look kind of, I, anyway, I had them made out of aluminum. Yeah. Uh, is, is the front not a problem? Front's not a problem. Is it three quarter curve size? Judd, stay, stay with your question now. I'll, I'll go back down to Greg. Oh, I just said, anybody want to buy a nice set of wire wheels? <laughs> yeah. Greg, you started the way in there. It's, yeah, I just said it's, it's it's three quarter per side. It's not three quarter overall. Correct, three quarters per side. Uh, uh, John, are you talking about uh, uh, Triumphs now, or are you talking about MGs? MGs. Well, MGs, it's a different rear axle if you want to do it right. If you want to do it right. But Judd wondered if you could you just put longer studs in and use a spacer to move from wire wheels to disc wheels, and you can. I've done it. You can't go the other way. You can't, you, there's no way to make the, the, the axle narrower, but there is a way to make it wider with, with longer studs and a spacer. I gotcha. Okay, all right. So here we go. I'm, I'm gonna switch over now to the chat section. And again, here, I'll, I'll call on you. And if you're still on, you know, answer and tell me where you're from. And, and if someone else has a comment about, about the subject, something that just happened to you, or you solved it in a different way than I proposed, please just speak up and, and we'll have a nice conversation. So from Skip Karekas, John, uh, recently I seem to have developed a high speed occasional miss. The points have less than 500 miles on them. Distributor was built by Schlemmer. Uh, I opened up the distributor to make sure the points were opening and they were opening. So I don't know what else to look for. Do you have any other recommendations? Oh boy. So, you know, this, these occasional, occasional things are so difficult to sort out. So it's either spark or gas. Okay. So we don't have to look at tire pressure or clutch or it's either, you know, one or the other. So the ignition side is always the easier side to look at. That's why I started there. Yep. And, um, you know, you look, you feel your coil after, after you run for a while, it shouldn't be super hot. What does that mean? I can't tell you. Um, you know, you should be getting a nice spark. You know, you can, while the car is running, if you dare, you can pull off each of the wires in succession and, and see how it's sparking to make sure that each one's sparking, but it, it will be. So, um, yeah, the thing is, John, you could, I can be driving it for an hour and it's fine. And then all of a sudden I'll get this occasional miss three or four of them, and then it'll be fine again. Is this, is there any other indicator on this? Are you going up a slight incline? No, I can, I, you know, I can, uh, I can go uphill and it'll be fine. And then, you know, like 20 minutes later, it starts, it just misses. And it doesn't, it doesn't sound like it's going to stop. It's just a nuisance miss. And, and there's no indication on your tag. No, I've tried to, I, you know, I, I, uh, I put it on the freeway thinking, well, you know, if I'm doing 4,000 RPM, it's going to be the most demand, you know, and it was fine. It gave me like two or three misses and then it was fine for the next 30 minutes. So I just, I've never had anything like this, you know, because I mean, everything in the ignition, I, I think it's ignition side because it's, it's not starving, you know, like it, it doesn't sound to me, it doesn't feel like it's going to stop or I need to get to the side of the road. It's just a nuisance. Is it, is it the, is it the whole engine that quits or is it just one cylinder that seems to drop out? Well, that I that I don't, I don't know. You it's, know, it's, it's just really hard. hard to tell. Yeah, yeah. So, 
but I thought you might have some insight. So it, it's just the coil's a good idea. I hadn't thought about the coil. If you got if you got another coil, you I do. Can just, That's what I mean. I can just throw another coil in there. Put it on properly or duct <laughs> duct tape it with the coil. <laughs> you know, just temporarily. You no. Know? Yeah. Um, hey guys, how about the how about the condenser? That's the first thing I would. That's at. what I you know I you know I'll tell you what I thought it was the condenser, but I went to John's uh, uh, video, and John's video said it's never the condenser, and if it is, the car will run like crap. Well, <laughs> that's an old video. Um, that's a, the, um, the, the things have things have changed since then, Glenn. Uh, Glenn at Glenn's MG Service in Tampa and St. Petersburg, Florida, told me, he said, you know, the automotive industry was making condensers, perfect condensers for over a hundred years. And then like five years ago, they forgot how. Yeah. And, and that, re that really is. And I, you know, Schlemmer gets as you know, the quality stuff as he can. Nobody has a condenser tester. There are such things, but they're, they're not common at all. So you could just replace the condenser and see if, if that might do it. I mean, Tom's, okay. Tom's on the money there. Because that's what I was going to start doing. But then I watched your video and I thought, well, you know, if John Twist says it's not going to happen, it couldn't possibly happen. I'll have to review the video. <laughs> Thanks, John. Okay. Hey, and Skip, where, where are you calling from? Seattle. Okay. All right, still three o'clock in the afternoon out there or something? Yeah. Five eleven. <laughs> sure. okay. Do you All have right. gross jets in your carburetors? No. Okay, good. No. Because I had I had the same problem years ago, and um, the former uh, technical advisor for um, Namberger told me he says, "Well, apparently they got a harmonic bounce in them at, at certain speeds." And it would do the same thing your car was doing. I thought he was kidding. And uh, he told me to get something called Seafoam and put it in there and, and use a, um, oh, at the time it was a neon pit, uh, tip Jaguar jet in my uh, SU carburetors. Oh. And I thought he was pulling my leg. So I walked into Napa and I said, do you have Seafoam? And they said, yeah. And uh, I bought some and put the jets in and it was, I haven't had a problem since then. Yeah, I run Seafoam so, about every other tank just to, yeah. to keep it clean. Yeah. yeah. Okay. All right. Thanks. Okay. okay. Let's see. Ruth. I'm listening to the MGBGT song now from the album uh, album Mirror Blue. Yeah, that was the conversation we had before you joined, John. Oh, okay. okay yeah. It's great. It's great fun. Thank you. I should yes, enjoy it. I'll listen again. That's a real heavy. Um, that's a real heavy beat, isn't it? Yeah. Yeah, that's it's British. I, my guess is we Mike, Mike found it in our shop. I because he I don't know he had hours of nothing else to do, so he he <laughs> found it. And we had some huge big speakers, and he wired them all up. And uh, sometimes the whole building would reverberate. Oh my to, god! You know, to, to the, <laughs> yeah, I had that, to. I had to down the volume on my computer a bit. <laughs> yep. MGBGT by Mirror Blue. If you haven't listened to it, go listen to it. And then, and then, as long as we're talking about other media, uh, then go on Hulu and find MGs Forever. That's my favorite, favorite, absolutely hands down favorite MG video of all time. Oh, okay. There's, uh, there's two you. versions of that. Soon, uh, Peter Tork wrote one. He owned an MGBGT. It's a little different. There's two different songs. Oh, okay. And it's my MGBGT, and it's it's kind of neat. I mean, it's not a it's not going to win any awards, but but if you have an MG, it's but it's our song. It's, it's our our song, you know. Exactly. So, exactly. Yeah. Great. Okay. Doug Miller at Peterborough, you said you would send out your PowerPoint about engine rebuilding. Where can I find it? Oh, Doug, I'm, you know, I wish I could get all this stuff done. I, I'm so dissatisfied with the way that all the stuff's loosely assembled. Um, and I, and I, I, uh, I've got some help now to, to put some of this stuff together. 
and I'm embarrassed. So just uh, send me another email and I'll, I'll send that out to you. I will. I can send you the PowerPoint. It's only got the, it's only got the, the, uh, the good stuff on it. And I think we tried screen sharing last time a little bit. I was able to do it, uh, but that was a, that was a fun one because I had all my little um, formulas up there, like, like horsepower equals torque times RPM. I mean, it's real stuff, but it, it sometimes it's really helpful when you're looking at this stuff. Anyway, should um, I send you an email or a text? Yeah, just send me an email, Doug, again. And I'm I'm so embarrassed that you called me out publicly, though. I'll send it right away. Uh -huh. I tried to I tried to word it as gracefully as I could. Uh, hey, you, you have to be a pretty emphatic sometimes. But um, anyway, I'm I'm reminded I'll, I will do that. So, where where are you calling from? Holland, Ohio. Okay. Oh, right up the road from from uh, Tony. From Tony, yeah. You remember the gearbox issue we've been talking about? Yes, yes, yes. We're still working on it. I'll you got you, you got that use you got that use piece from uh, Deershaw. Yeah, the interlock arm was put in today. They ran the gearbox through all sorts of tests and weird stuff. Everything worked fine outside of the car. So um, the gearbox goes in tomorrow, the engine back in, and we'll see what happens. Okay. Good luck. All right. From iPhone, my 78 MGB, when it's very hot, over 80 degrees outside, my temp gauge goes to between half and almost to red. Then the fan kicks on, and it goes a little, to, goes to a little over half. Is this normal? So who's iPhone? Can it's you... Barry. Oh, all right. Okay. So you've probably got a relatively new sending unit in your car. Is that possible? Yeah, because, possible. Um, because most of the new sending units are not calibrated correctly. The electrical part that threads in. But normally what I think I'd see on an MGB is that temp gauge to rise to maybe three quarters and then the fans kick on and then it comes back down. If you look at it real carefully, there's like a little umlaut right there in the middle and, and it should run right in there. But it may Mine be- Mine doesn't have any marks. Mine does, my temperature gauge just does have the middle one. Okay. So it may be that your car is running at an okay temperature, but it's indicating poorly. So you can drive it someday to a, a neighborhood um, neighborhood repair shop and give somebody ten bucks to come out and shoot it with a with a uh, infrared pyrometer right at the sending unit under the bonnet and see what it actually says. And just normally you'd expect to find a temperature, a cylinder head temperature of around 190 to 200 degrees. Okay. So sometimes it's the gauge, which is, which is acting up, not the gauge, but the sending unit is acting up and that's giving you a false reading. So, so it's, it's, if the car is not overheating while you're driving it, if it restarts all the time, then basically you've got no problem. But still, I understand yep. how it can bug you when you're looking at that gauge and, and get yep. creeped about it. So, yeah. uh, thank you. Okay. I'm from Seoul in Ohio. Yeah, all right. You're not from there, though. Where, where, where are you from? Uh, South Africa. Oh, all right. Durban, Cape Town, Johannesburg. Cape Town. Okay. Okay. Um, I met that, that, that fellow that was on a few months ago. Yes. Yes. Um, Ruth, come on. Um, Norm Ewing. Yes. Correct. Yes. Yeah. You're the I pilot. To him. You're, you're the pilot, right? No. Oh, all right. Okay. All right. Well, thanks. Thanks, John. Appreciate hey, your help. Sure. Call anytime. Thanks. Okay. From Greg to everybody. It's interesting that Kelvin's air conditioner burst since Kelvin is the scale they use 
to measure the temperature from absolute zero. Okay, that's good. <laughs> okay, okay. I don't remember that coming up during the, during the conversation during the whole meet. Okay, we got Zoom user. Zoom user. I wonder who this is. Uh, recently resuming my MGB passion. Uh, put a 68 B away 24 years ago. Retirement has allowed me to get it going again. But practice uh, to restart engine. Already dealing with gas tank, brakes, new differential, and gearbox oils. So, Zoom user. You can unmute yourself if you're still here. But we don't have anybody coming up. But anyway, to... Um, when you pull a car out of retirement like that, the, you rebuild the rear brakes, absolutely, and exercise or rebuild the front brakes. Probably have to rebuild the hydraulics for the clutch. And again, it's, it's usually uh, just as easy to rebuild them as it is to replace them with the new units. Yeah, I, I can oh. do all that safety stuff. Okay. Um, I, I haven't been uh, a more than a um, dirt floor, you know, garage mechanic, but um, cylinders seize, you know, do you put oils into the spark plugs? Do you pull off the, the valve cover? Sure. Do, so do, you, you, what, you, what all do you do to the engine itself when it's sat for that long? I put it away fast and wet yep like riding um, a horse and so it's, it's so the engine the engine's frozen you're pretty sure i don't know oh, i okay. haven't even gotten to the engine yet okay I'm starting well, at the back all right so buy a single group 26 battery yep and that that'll fit in there and you'll okay you, you take the spark plugs out shoot some oil in the holes just for fun and try the starter motor. And if it spins over, you're home free. If it doesn't, if it doesn't, if the if the, the engine's locked up, then you can fill the cylinders with some kind of penetrant. There's breakaway, there's PB blaster. Uh, some people use Marvel mystery oil. You, you, I can't tell you which one's the best one to use. Mm -hmm. Then take the starter motor out of the engine, take the distributor out of the engine, maybe even the alternator. So you've got the whole right-hand side of the engine clear and they get a long breaker, a uh, long bar. Um, I've got a great big long bar. It looks like a screwdriver with a bent end on it. It's just great. And you wedge that between the rear engine bearing plate and the teeth on the flywheel and lever it. You can get a lot of force there. You need to try to move it one way and try to move it the other way. That's why you've got the starter and the generator and the, or, or the alternator and the, and the distributor out of the way so you can, you can put a lever in there and wiggle it. And once it's free, hey, that's it. You're, you're, our, you're all right. Um, and then you just have to walk it around maybe once. Then you can use the starter motor to spin it. But remember, when you do that, you're going to get just an enormous spray of all this okay. stuff shooting out of the cylinders. So you, that you put in there. Yeah, so you don't want to be standing on the right-hand side of the engine when you, when you, hit, when you hit the starter motor, um, not, not at all. And you can make a case for once the brakes are done, if the engine's still a little stiff, to put a, a toe strap on it and pull it behind a, a modern vehicle. At a low speed, 20 miles an hour in second gear around the block, and that'll free the engine up real nice. You get oil pressure, so forth. So the differential takes a, a GL4, gear lube number four, 8090, and the gearbox takes engine oil. You can you don't have to spend the, the, the tall amount of money that you normally would for good engine oil. You can just use any kind of 2050. The engine should use a high zinc oil, and Valvoline makes a good one called VR, Valvoline VR1 in 2050. Rack and pinion takes 90 weight gear oil. Use grease just in NLGI number two lithium grease at all the grease points. Like on the front. I went, I went at, uh, 
I went ahead and did your complete lubrication okay, printout. And so I'm just going to go top to bottom, page to page. Excellent. Yep. Just every you put it, you do everything on there, tighten the front shocks, just you know, grease the outer wheel bearings, exercise the brake calipers, grease up the, the seat slides, oil the door strikers, do all that kind of stuff. And, and then and then it's operational and you can go out and drive it and, and see see what you've actually got. Okay, appreciate the input. Where where are you calling from again? Chambersburg, Pennsylvania, South Central. Below, sure. um, may see you in Altoona. Okay, great, great. That's where the uh, the 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 flight the nine eleven flight went down, wasn't it? Nearby. Yep. Yep. Okay. Okay. Well, hey, good luck. Have a great one. Thank you. Thanks. All right. This this uh, note here is from. Uh, Marnin Heisel. Uh, hi, John. I just got my 78B out of storage a few weeks ago. And although it starts and runs well, it wants to die at idle. The Zenith Stromberg carb seems to be misbehaving. The metering needle seems reluctant to move. Uh, I can uh, add a few additional strange points to the story, but that's enough for a start. So, um, Martin, how, how long has it been since this uh, has been on the road? Okay. Yeah. <laughs> I know. So how, right. how how long has it been off the road? Just since December. Oh, so it was just so just away over the winter. Oh yeah, that's not yeah. Really long. So but it was uh, it was running. It, it always seems to be running a little rich, and I thought I'd try and uh, fix it before putting it away. And it wasn't really doing much. So I thought, well, I'll deal with it this year. So uh, I went to the place where I store it, started it up, great, heated up, all right. As I uh, went to take it out of the person's garage, it died on me, got it going, drove it home. Whenever I would stop at a stop sign, as soon as the rev started dropping, it would cut out. So I thought, okay, I just have to turn the idle up a bit. Didn't do it. In fact, I turned it up so much at one point, the, uh, the fine adjustment screw came out. So I went, okay, put that back in. And I thought, well, maybe, uh, although the carb always seems a bit rich, I thought maybe it's it's too lean. At any rate, I put the uh, the tool in the top of the Stromberg carb, and it doesn't want to turn at all. Okay, so I, maybe it's so stuck a little. The uh, the idle screw the idle screw is on the left hand side of the carburetor. It's a spring loaded screw on the linkage. Yeah, you, you said the fine the final. The, yeah, a... I used the one on the right side, which I guess is the fine adjustment. Yes. So maybe I should be uh, going for the other you one. Go for the other one. Go for the spring-loaded screw. Okay. And and uh, my my suggestion is take that take that fine uh, mixture adjustment screw and just screw it all the way back in until it bottoms out. Okay. So uh, the then to change you've got to change the O ring in the in the piston uh, so that it, it doesn't consume oil. I've got a YouTube video up about it. And although they're all, um, Marty's has renumbered them all and retitled some of them, I still haven't done my side of it, which is to get them organized. Um, so I can't tell you which number video it is, but I've got one there about how to change the O-ring. Okay. And that, you've got to find that. So go on YouTube and just put down Stromberg, you know, something like that, and, and peel through them until you can find mine that shows you how to do it. Okay. So do you a, think that's why it's sticking a little bit? Um, that's why you can't adjust the mixture. You've got to be able to adjust the mixture if you're going to tune the car at all. And it's, sure. it's always a good time to change the, the diaphragm. And if you don't already have an extra diaphragm, order two, carry one in your glove box. Because it's, you, and you can buy a new headlight at Napa, you can buy a tail light, you can buy a fan belt. But you can't buy a Stromberg diaphragm, for sure. So just I, always, always have an extra one in the car. I was thinking I should get a rebuild kit, which should include most uh, of you, these pieces. Yeah, you can. It, 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 you've, got to, you've got to come up with that O-ring. I think it's a number eight. I think it's a number eight O-ring, and I very well say that on my video. So if you can't find the video, call me tomorrow, and I'll, I'll see if I can help you find it. Um, that sounds good. I'll, I'll very quickly walk you through what was happening next because I kept trying to adjust it 
and turning the car on and off and on and off. I thought, you know, I'm probably just feeling feeding too much fuel in and I'm going to end up flooding the engine. So I went around to look at the plugs and I happened to notice that the number one plug had white gunk around it on the outside. I pulled it and it looked almost like there was corrosion on it. So I, I happened to uh, be at uh, a Canadian tire. I'm, I'm in London, Ontario. And uh, there were a couple of guys there having sort of a classic car night. I mentioned to one guy who had a 67B and he said, oh, sounds like you've got a cracked block. I then spoke to somebody <laughs> about a part because I'm missing a spacer for the air cleaner. He said, oh, I wonder if you got a cracked head. So they've got everything cracking on this car. At any rate, one thing I wondered is whether in fact at one point, it was maybe a year or so ago, again, I pulled it out of storage. I topped up the, uh, the antifreeze just to make sure and got it running nice and hot, had a nice drive, came back, turned it off, and I heard a hissing noise. Of course, the, uh, the little sensor, I know you call it an ERP switch in one of your videos, yes. popped out. So now I know I turned the, uh, the clamp on the upper rad hose, it can't pop out anymore, but it did. And I wonder if it in fact just showered the number one plug. And so I got a little bit of burnt antifreeze on it. I, sure. don't know. I mean, you always do the cheapest, easiest, simplest stuff first. So before you take the whole engine apart, you go at it step by step. Yeah. Maybe that, that sounds good. Fin maybe final question and I'll, I'll stop. Yeah. I was uh, re-watching, or I think I watched a newer video that you did on adjusting the valve lash, which is something I had done a couple of years ago, got it set nicely. And I notice in the newer one, you say, always retorque your head. I thought, hmm, I didn't do that. And then of course I looked online and some people say, I've never retorqued my head. Others said, if you have a good seal, you can lose that. So I thought I'd ask, what's, what's your advice on, I'm, and of course I haven't changed the head gasket or anything like that. Is that something you recommend doing or only do if you have to do? I almost always do, do it uh, on a complete tune-up and you, you only loosen up one, one nut at a time. I've got a, I probably got a video up about how to do it, but there's a spiral. You start with yeah. a middle stud on the right-hand side and just spiral it out and you, you back, you back the, the nut all, all half the way off and put oil on it and pull it down to 55 pounds and go to the next one and do it and go to the next one and do it. You only ever have one nut loose at the same time. The, the whole car, the engine's been expanding, contracting. Every time it gets hot, stuff's moved. You know, it's not, it's not, um, it's pretty much linear, but it's not perfect. All that expansion and contraction. So, you know, who, it, it just, it, it's, it behooves you to, to, um, do it if you've never done it before. Sounds good. I appreciate that. Thank you. Okay. All right. I, was, I just I spent a night in London coming back from uh, Ottawa. I was up there in the, uh, at the uh, Ottawa MG Club and coming back to Grand Rapids. And it's like a 12 hour run, I don't know, 13 hour run. And I thought, I can't, <laughs> not going to do that in one day, not anymore. So I, I uh, overnighted. Right, right, uh, um, Wellington, a whole bunch of hotels, right at Wellington and the 401. So, yeah, 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 yep. excellent. Okay. All right, well, hey, thank Thanks. you very much, Tim Ross. 74B would not start after a long drive. Yep. We had spark and gas, seemed to be flooded, towed it home, disassembled the carbs. Front had, uh, front had a stuck float in the up position. The rear was okay. No kidding. Yeah. The float was stuck in an HIF. Yeah. Stuck up. Yeah. That's so bizarre. Yeah. It is possible that the floats get um, switched from carb to carb. It is possible to do that. Not, not if you're being careful, but, um, and usually when that happens, there's so little gasoline in the float bowl that the car runs poorly. And so you're aware right away that something's going on, but um, God, I've never heard of one being stuck up. Anyway, why would it be stuck up? What, what caused it to, 
to jam so? Well, uh, it's been running well for many years. Runs like a top. And then uh, I come off the highway and speeds. We're going to like a car show and came near a stop side and, uh, and it just it just cut off. And I started up very rough, moved it about a block, parked it and opened the hood up there and the fuel filter was dry. And I just let it sit for a couple hours, took the gas cap off to see if it was a vacuum uh, leak from the evaporative system. And anyway, tried it later and the, the pump worked. The, and it filled the filter up with gas. And what, when I went to go, it just kept cranking and cranking. So we checked for spark. Mm. The, we took the first two plugs out that were wet. And the rear plugs were dry, the way they normally are. And uh, we're getting lots of gas out of the fuel pump and stuff. So anyway. Yeah, that's, that's pretty bizarre. I guess I'd buy a new float. Yeah, so I was thinking new floats and needle valves. The, when I took the float off, usually the, the spindle part of it, the plastic, usually should be square, but the one on it was was tapered to one side. So maybe it was just jamming up there. It's bizarre. They are the original floats. I rebuilt the car okay. about a dozen years ago. So, it, Again, I, you know, I, I, if you want, tomorrow, whenever you have a chance, snap a picture of what you got. Send it to me, and, and I, I can give you an armchair analysis. Where, where are you calling from? Uh, Fredericton, New Brunswick, Canada. Okay. All right. An armchair analysis at 1,000 miles. <laughs> yeah. Yep. So, yeah. so there, we got the big MG meet in Calgary um, next year. Mm -hmm. That's a long way to go. It's 3,000 miles. It's a long way for everybody to go. Yeah. Anyway. No, it's uh, no, I enjoy your show. Oh, I remember some of your videos. You said when you rebuild an HIF carburetor, always replace the floats. Yeah, I'm not, I'm, I'm, I'm not on that bandwagon anymore. But boy, it's so fr there's, it's so frustrating to get them all installed and then have another problem. Mm -hmm. So that that's that was what engendered those comments. But anyway, something's going on. I'd love to see a picture of, of this float that got stuck. So if you have a chance, you know, you find my phone number on the web and on my, on my oh, speaking of that, I, I uh, sometimes I forget to say anything about my PayPal button. I did say that at the, at the beginning. But again, if you, if you are, any of you, all of you are so inclined, um, I would sincerely appreciate, I'll read your name and I'll, I'll send you a note on the, on the internet. I do those in batches, haven't done them for a month or so, maybe longer. But anyway, I do sincerely appreciate it. Anyway, my phone number's on the on the website too. So so all right, Tim, good luck. John, can I ask one more oh, quick yeah. question? It, yeah. It's morning again. Uh, and I'll kick kick myself if I don't. And this has been one that I've been dealing with ever since I've had the car, six, seven years. So it's got uh it it's got the twin electric fans on it. Uh, whenever I pull into the garage, it's running hot. The fans are running great. But of course, when I turn off the ignition, the fans stop. And I think everything just drops. I probably want it cooling a little bit more. So I tend to leave it on the first click of the ignition. But of course, then the fuel filter keeps going. Right. So, so just turn it off. It's all right. Got it. It doesn't do anything. It doesn't hurt. No. Anything. MGAs, MGAs, which you've got a mechanical temp gauge a safety gauge and the, the top half of it is, is rated in, in uh, pounds per square inch of oil pressure and the bottom which runs the opposite way is your temperature. Um, the joke is on MGAs that, that it'll get so hot it'll go up to, you say how hot was my car and you go 80 pounds. It's way, way up into the other gauge it gets so hot but it, it only does that just briefly when the car is starting to uh, after you shut it off the underbonnet temperature spikes and then falls away again. So, right. so you. sorry. So you got an American spec car because of the, 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 Cal or the uh, Canadian spec MGBs only had one cooling fan. Exactly. My parents picked it up outside of Pittsburgh. So the nice thing also, I think at least, is it, uh, it's automatic choke. And it also has, and I had switched my uh, the coil a couple of years ago when I when I changed the plugs, 
Um, it's also got that little sort of like electronic ignition box or something underneath the, uh, the coil. Yeah, th those are good. Those are good. Those are still wonderfully operational, the CEI systems. Yeah. Hey, John. Yes. I had a question for the fellow from Canada. When you're putting your car away in the winter and letting it sit for months, are you putting it away with ethanol fuel in there? And does Canada use ethanol fuel? Well, I can comment oh. on that. We, oh. uh, um, I always put premium in. Premiums non-ethanol, about 91 octane. But so ethanol is is a. We got guys who repair gas systems and just say no way. Just it glues everything together and uh, just don't use it. That my comment was for the other fellow from Canada yeah. who's having trouble um, with the with the miss and the, the. It sounds like it's clogged up uh, pilot jets and small small orifices in the carb. It, it's not idling well. It could be, and I wondered about just going and getting a tank of good gas and running it through and hoping, you know, maybe putting some uh, carb cleaner or fuel cleaner in. Uh, the answer is, and unlike Tim, although somebody, the guy told me I might have a, a cracked block said use the 91 uh, octane. I've been using the other end, but I always search out a station that's supposed to use ethanol free gas uh, for that reason. But, Perfect. Uh, harder to find these days. That's all I use in my in all the vehicles that, that sit for a few weeks, non-ethanol all the way around. Yeah. Yeah. But it's it's hard to find. They want to put it in everything. So yep. Thanks, Tom. Okay. We got more carburetor stuff here from Greg Fisher. Uh, the charcoal canisters in the SU HS4 carburetors, how to hook them up, or should I? Yes, Greg, are you are you on? I am. I am. So so right here behind me is yeah. where I would put the new the charcoal canisters back in. This is a 78. Right. Yes. Uh, so the engine's going to be completely different. Put those in and the the HS carburetors have got uh, two brass fittings on the float bowl lids. One's one's fuel in and one is a vent to allow atmospheric pressure to sit on top of the gasoline. We always call them overflows because that's the only time we ever see them work. So you're going to tee together the vents from each carburetor and take that line over to the charcoal canister so that when it's operating correctly, um, there's neither pressure nor vacuum on the, on the gasoline and the float bowl and your anti-run-on system will work. I've got a diagram of this, Greg, and if you send me a... Um, an email tomorrow, uh, tonight, tomorrow, I will send that because I just drew it out for somebody who's doing the same thing. And then you want to put your anti run on valve back in uh, both charcoal, uh, both you've got two charcoal canisters. What, what year is your car? Yeah, yeah. I've got two. It's, it's, a, it's a 78. Yeah. That's okay. It's, it's a passive, <clears throat> it's a passive system. Doesn't take any energy. It doesn't. It doesn't degrade the performance. Uh, it I nominally keeps the atmosphere cleaner, um, and the anti-run-on valve will work. Which means when you turn the key, key off, car stops dead. Just dead. Doesn't doesn't uh, diesel on, which can be a problem. So. Okay. Thank you. Very much. Uh, let's see. Uh, Doug Wolfire, we're back uh, talking about the 67 rear end. Um, okay, this, this is just a continuation, is it, Doug, of, of what we talked about before? Yes, yes it is, John. Okay, all right. Um, all right. Let me just ask a, a reference question, though, because um, when we move that rear wheel or move the front wheel, how much play should we have in a... As little as possible. Right. So, uh, you know, it just, it, that's, I mean, I know it sounds stupid, but that's, you can measure the hubs, you can measure the hubs of the caliper, 2.450, and you can see how much wear there is. Of course, you can't switch the front to the rear or the left to the right because of the, because of the, um, the, the, the nuts, but you can, uh, you, or the spinners, but you can see how worn it is. The only way to judge the wheel is to run your finger in the splines 
and towards the, towards the inside of the wheel, and you'll get to the point where it's not worn, and, and your finger will rise to the unworn part of the splines. And you can, sometimes you feel it and you go, gosh, I can barely feel anything there at all. And other times it feels like it's a quarter of an inch worn. So obviously you want as little wear as you can. Okay, any suggestions from the crowd as to where to buy good wheels? Because I'm probably on that slippery slope. Um, you know, I haven't bought wheels in a long time. I, you know, I, um, Dayton Wire Wheel, Dayton, Ohio, long backlog, excellent wheels. I don't know how much more expensive that the, they are from the Dunlop wheels that come out of India that everybody else sells. So you just have to mix and match. The nice thing about the Dayton Wire Wheels, and maybe the new Dunlop wheels are like this too, is that the, the spokes are not chrome, they're stainless, so they don't they don't corrode and you're always able to get them adjusted. If you're going for gold, maybe even platinum, um, then you talk to, to uh, Hendrix Wire Wheel in Greensboro, North Carolina, Alan Hendrix, H-E-N-D-R-I-X. You can buy the wheels from him and he'll mount the tires. And he'll put them on his machine and shave them so that they're absolutely round because no wheel is well no wheel is perfectly round no matter how much shaving you do but he'll shave it so it's a whole lot rounder <laughs> than it was when it left the factory so he alan Hendricks is a is an interesting place to, to and you just have to call him out for prices it's always expensive so and moss you know moss sells the, the wheels and i you know abingdon spares and, and northwest import parts I think everybody else probably sells wheels too. And you can get them right out of England. It probably doesn't cost very much more, but the ones from England very well are also made in, in, uh, India. in the Dunlop plant in, in India, so. John, I have to uh, say, if, if he's gonna stay with wire wheels, sending them to Hendrix is worth the money. The Hendrix did the ones on my MGB the, up for the previous owner, and it is the smoothest riding car uh, that I've ever been in. Uh, and I had, I hate wire wheels, but these wire wheels are round and, and smooth and properly balanced. Somebody else may do it as well, but Hendrix is the guy to go to. Thanks, Judd. Appreciate that. Okay. Paul. Toker. Sorry. Paul. I'm sorry. I was going to say oh. Toker Tire also sells the uh, wire wheels with the tires mounted. They do. I don't know what I don't know who their source is, but they will sell you the wire wheels. And, there, and remember, there's two different types of wire wheels. You can get tubeless and you can get tube type. And tubeless means that they've taken a, a, whole, um, a whole tube of silicone caulk and smeared it around where all the spokes come out because as the wheel runs, the spokes all move. And as long as the spokes are tight enough, they're not gonna move very much. And as long as the silicone's good enough and thick enough, it won't perforate. But when it does, it, you can't find you can't find where it where where it's leaking not, not very easily. I'm 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 still with me. My jury's still out on the on the uh, tubeless wire wheels. I'd much rather put a tube in there. But that's just me, and I'm old fashioned. So, all right. So we got um, Paul M. I'm here. What what injury did Cecilia have? An overhead garage door fell on her head and knocked her down. Oh no, she's. I mean, she isn't four foot ten. Right. Um, well, maybe she's only four foot nine now. Oh my gosh, I, I had no idea. Yeah, she thought it was well known. And I just thought I'd mention it today for folks Thank to you. know her and care. I just saw her out at GT47. It obviously happened since then. Yeah, yeah, just I think maybe two weeks ago. Okay, all right. Well, thank you. I'll 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 uh, pass on my my uh, greetings and stuff. Yeah, thank you, Paul. Thanks. Where, where are you calling from? Ridgeway, Pennsylvania. Okay. 
Okay, Matt, Matt to everybody. Hi, John. I'm having a steering suspension concern on my stock 1980 MGB. Everything seems fine around town, but I'm getting a loud vibration from the steering when doing highway speed corners on ramps and off ramps. A loud vibration from the steering. You're still on, Matt? Yeah, I'm here. So does, does, does the wheel shake? Um, you, can, you can feel it feedback in the wheel. Um, it's, just, it's, it's, it's like a loud vibration. I don't really know how else to explain it. Uh, but it, I only feel it when I'm kind of doing those sweeping, like higher speed corners. Boy. I'm having, I'm having, you know, this is this is out of out of the out of the ordinary. That's why you're asking it here. Yeah. Um, so you know, you bounce the front shocks. You make sure that the front shocks are absolutely firm and the front end doesn't bounce I around. Can't off the sound here, but okay. Here, I'm gonna hit, I'm gonna hit mute all. Here, I'm gonna hit mute all, and then and then uh, Matt, you're gonna have to un unmute yourself again. Um, so. You, you know, you check the shocks, that's easy enough to do. Jack the front end up, grab the wheel, sit, you know, at uh, 12 and six and shake it, you know, shake it sideways and to see if, if, um, if there's any free play, if the wheel bearings are loose because they haven't been installed properly, the shims aren't in there. Um, any any recent work on the front suspension? New brakes or anything? Um, no, no. Uh, not within the last five six years, anyway. Okay, how old are the tires? The tires are about uh, eight years, I'd say. Okay, that probably means ten, but okay, all right. So you can also when it when it's up in the up in the air in the front end because you're just looking you're looking for something, you know. Make sure the shocks are tight. Uh, on the on the on the uh, on the chassis, that's just a deep nine sixteen socket and a ratchet. Uh, but spin the wheel, spin the wheel, and feel it with your other hand as as the wheel is going around, and just feel it. And see if there's any lumps or high spots or scalloping or anything on the wheel. Um, knows that that's about it as far as uh, what you can grease it. You can heavily grease it. You got six grease points, and go out and see if it's still doing it. And it may not do it for a, for a couple of turns and then start doing it again uh, as the grease uh, shakes out of uh, out of where it is. But a, a good physical inspection and and um, just making sure that everything is tight. Just get down there if you you need a eleven sixteenths and and uh, well half inch a half inch socket nine sixteenths socket half inch wrench and. Um, if you load, if you load the, the suspension, meaning that if you jack the front of the car up and the suspension on both sides falls, it's under under great stress and and it'll it'll eat up any free play that's up there. But if you're on jack stands and then you take a trolley jack and go underneath the A-arm and pick up that A-arm so that the car just about just about comes off the jack stand on that side. So it's not loaded, and then wiggle stuff and see if you can get anything to move. Other than a physical inspection like that, I don't know what to do. It's, if I was driving it, I'd say, "Oh, it's this, maybe, <laughs> maybe." So, thank you, sir. Okay, uh, Paul M. The pinion drive for the Speedo, my '62 MGA has worn teeth on the plastic gear. So they're very sharp and will disengage in some, at some times. Neither Moss nor Cecilia has this part, the pinion drive for the Speedo on your A. Moss doesn't That's sell right. it. Not available right. in either catalog. All right, well, the, the, the one that's on the main shaft is steel. Right. So. Um, Paul Deershaw, uh, sports car craftsman, Arvada, Colorado. I'll give you his phone number. Just a moment. 
Just a moment, looking. I should have this memorized. Um, I send a lot of people to him. He's got a lot of parts. So we've got uh, sports car craftsman in Denver, Colorado is 303-422-9272. Paul. Okay. And so he's a spot. And then uh, there's a guy that does a lot of rebuilding, um, uh, quantum mechanics. John Esposito, he's in what, New Hampshire, Massachusetts, Connecticut, someplace in the Northeast. And he does a lot of a lot of rebuilds, so he might have one. John, where is this plastic pinion that he's talking about? Because I've got a speedo gear. It's a speedo gear on the inside on, the speedometer or not at the transmission? At the transmission. That's not steel like in the T series. In the in the in the T series, the driving and driven gear are both steel. In in the in in the next 20 years of production, the driving gear is steel and the driven gear, the pinion gear is plastic. And then towards the end, they're both plastic. Oh, really? Yep. I may have the same problem. I, I thought it was the same steel on steel as in the T-Series. So making one on a 3D printer would be interesting because that's a, that's a helical gear. I think. I don't know much about gears, but that's interesting. Paul, are you still here? Yes, yeah, I am. Okay. All right. So that's 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 my guess there. And um there's there's a lot of people with a lot of gearboxes around. I, I can't believe it's gonna be hard to hard to find that, but um um just keep, yeah, just, just keep, keep hunting. Somebody will have it. Okie doke. Thank you. All right. Now let's call um, Glenn at Glenn's MG service in St. Petersburg, Florida. He's got a lot of gearboxes apart. So, and I used to have a whole box of them, <laughs> but, but um, that's a hard for Forrest to find some of that stuff now. Okay. From Daniel Hills. If the front shocks are bad, can you see the fluid leak? Sometimes. The answer is sometimes. Sometimes it is just a failure inside the shock itself. I, I, I don't understand how the compression stroke could fail to work, but I can see how the rebound stroke would, would be bad. Sometimes the valve gets gummed up with stuff. But if it is leaking, it's leaking out the axle, front or rear, and that's really easy to see. And the fluid level is way down. So. All right, uh, back, back to Pat G. When I had an MG shop, I am, uh, when I had an MG shop, I employed a couple of uh, former British Leyland dealership techs. They both removed the wheel bearing spacers and shims and set the bearings like the rest of the cars in the world. Never had a problem as a result. No, you won't, but it's not as strong. It's not as strong. It's faster. It's faster to, to do it that way, absolutely. But the proper way to do it, I, and I explain it like this. If you have a piece of electrical conduit and you put that on your knee and you pull real hard, you can, you can bend that electrical conduit. If you take a piece of um, threaded rod and you put that on your knee, God, that hurt, but put that on your knee. You can bend that too. But if you put the if you put that threaded rod through the conduit and tighten it up and get it really tight on the outside, you can't bend that. You cannot bend it because it's under stress. And that's what's going on with the front stub axle. That's under stress. So the, the, uh, the MGA is set up, the T-type set up like that, the MGA, the MGB, um, they're, all, they're all set up like that under stress so that the system is stronger than just the stub axle. John, the argument that, that was made is that 
looking at the other vehicles that use those wheel bearings, I'm sure you've seen when you buy them, it'll say set two or set three, I forget, but um, uh, things like VW buses and yeah. um, vehicles that are heavier than MGs um, did not use uh, bearing I've, spaces. I've never so. seen, I've never seen a stub axle broken off ever, not in all this time. I'm not a racer. And so there may be some racers that have got other stuff. I know when you go T-type <laughs> racing, um, you have to have proof of, of an X-ray of your front stub axles. And the are also on TCs. Yep. And I've never, I've never had one. But yeah, there's a, I, you know, just like anything else, there's a, there's, you know, the factory way of doing it. You can certainly do it other ways too. Absolutely. I, and I've only ever seen one stub axle where the end of it was broken off and the um, the outer wheel bearing had, had run completely dry, completely dry, <clears throat> so much so that it turned blue, changed the characteristics of the, of the stub axle, I guess, and snapped it off. And yet the inner wheel bearing still had grease in it. Lots of grease. Also <laughs> important to grease the, the spindle before you put the bearings on it. So they come back off, yes. <laughs> yep. That's not why, John. Um, because the inner race will sometimes spin on the spindle and create a stress riser. Okay. And, and uh, I can show you a spindle that nearly broke as a result. But anyway, moot point. Hey, thanks. <laughs> Enough out of me. Thanks. Uh, let's see. Oh, here we go. Uh, we're back to back to Pat. You bought the camber correction kit from Brown and Gammons. It's much cheaper than what's offered by the vendors here at all. It is, is a wedge. I mean, you, if you knew the dimensions, you'd do it yourself. So how much trouble was that, Pat, to install that? I mean, that's an all-day job. And then you got to take the, the coil springs out. I'm waiting for it. Once there. I had the cross member off, John, and rebuilt uh, the the kingpins and everything else it was a piece of cake oh sure <laughs> sure <laughs> yeah so yep. it was a it was a chore the whole so, front end overhaul so did you think that at the end of all that your steering effort was less was it worth it well john i i as long as i had the front end apart i went and bought uh a new set of uh um, spline, mini lights, wider, larger diameter, much stickier tires. Oh, yeah. So I can't you. speak to the no. steering effort no. because okay. I increased it a bunch with the tires. Okay. But it sure is fun to drive. <laughs> okay. All right. Like driving a go kart. Greg with a 70 midget. Here we go. A couple weeks back, I asked about my midget having an overheating problem. I have an update. So from Bowmansville, PA, Greg, are you still here? I'm here, John. Okay, you wait, oh my gosh, it's nine o'clock, it's quitting time. But, so what's your update? So I had a problem where it would, it would overheat or it would heat up and then would cool back and then run okay. So I went and I bought a new thermostat and a gasket and it must've scared the car because it runs perfect now. Okay. I don't know if the uh, thermostat had something sticky or whatever, but it cured itself. And it's been running good for the last two weeks. <laughs> okay. Well, that's that's the that's the trick. If you carry enough use you carry enough replacement parts in the boot, you know, like an extra, you don't need a starter motor because you know it's push start it, but you know, like another alternator and a complete distributor and a complete fuel pump. If you carry all that stuff. The car will never fail. That's my experience. So, oh, let's see. iPhone 5 it says, must be that's how many iPhones we've got on here tonight. Living in Florida, I want to remove all the heater associated material. What has to be done? Are you from Florida? Are you still here? Because we don't yes, have sir. Okay. What year and model is it? 80, 80 MGB. Okay. Well, 
you don't necessarily have to take the heater out because taking that out is just, I mean, you can buy a blanking plate, put it back in, but um, it's unnecessary, but you don't want the heat, any of the heat to go through the heater matrix. So the simple, the simple solution is to just take a line from the heater control valve and go over to the return line on the uh, bottom radiator hose. Or you can buy a blanking plate for the cylinder head. You put that in place of the heater control valve. Now it can't leak and it's easier to gain access to the dipstick and the distributor. And then over on the, the heater hose side of it, you have to find something to put into the heater hose and clamp it so that it won't leak. Um, so I I would I wouldn't take the I wouldn't take the heater motor out itself. Well, I want to clean up the engine bay, and that thing you know down in Florida we we have our own solar heating, so we don't doesn't require any kind of uh, heating element. That space there um, it would be nice to have. I blank that actually just remove that housing. Basically, okay. what I want is that housing and just join the line, the um, lines so that it never goes into the car itself Buy some kind of uh, plate if they that exists or, or fabricate something. Yeah, well, so the, um, you've got to disconnect both the heater controls in the console uh, and and um, and and uh, one of them one of them comes out with the heater control valve on the side of the on the side of the block. So you, you, that line comes out, but the other line that turns and deflects the, the heat from the from the cockpit up to the um, up to the defrost, that line you've got to disconnect from the heater control in the in the console, and then take the bonnet off so you can get access. Take all the Phillips screws off around the the, the periphery of the of the um, heater box, and there's a big screw at the top. Lever this thing away because it's real sticky. It's got it's got old uh, uh, closed cell foam uh, to hold it in place. Wrench it away from the from the firewall and grab a hold of it and struggle it out. Struggle it out. It's a it's a horror. It's putting it back in is worse. But <laughs> take it out. Once it, I'm sorry. Once it's out, then you can see what what to do and what to what to blank off. You know, it's just it's just a just a, like that. And that that piece might be available easier just to make it. I'm sure, but it might be available from someone in England. It wouldn't be available here. Cars that were delivered to the Bahamas and Jamaica um, uh, directly from England didn't have heaters in them. Uh, MGBs didn't have heaters, but I I don't know about the the real late ones. Yeah, Moss has them. It'll cost you. What, that plate? Yeah. Yeah. Oh, all right. Okay. Thank you. Um, is there any kind of um, literature, or is there an instruction sheet how that's done, or is this uh, you have a video on that? I don't have a video on that because I'm in Michigan, and and that's the last thing you you choose to do up here. Um, except today, it was pretty it's pretty toasty up here today. Um, you I can go on MG Experience. MG Experience. That's a massive website, and just pose the question. And you know, you, you, there's a lot along with along with great nuggets of of help and wisdom comes a lot of chaff. And you just have to you have to spread the chaff out of the way to to get to understand. You know, somebody is telling you the truth. Um, YouTube, YouTube has a number of videos kind of showing it in case you want to look at the bits and pieces. Okay, thank you. If I may, I have another question. Yeah, if I may. yeah. The um, the MG, the one I have uh, at idle. When it idles, it's fine. If I drive for uh, a distance, especially in this heat, the temperature goes up. I have a 14-inch um, push, 
I'm sorry, pull fan. And then there's another fan on the outside. It was another push fan. Um, I'm just wondering if I went from, a, let's say, a, I think it's a 14 to a 16. Would that help the cause? There are a, a number of ways you can cool down the engine. One is, one is to put the two original fans back in. Nothing takes more energy to run than the two original fans. They blow a lot of air. Another, another way to do it is with an aluminum radiator. Whereabouts are you in Florida? What can we tell them? Well, um, that's, I think that's across, the, that's across the state from St. Petersburg, but you've got Glenn, Glenn's MG service. And Glenn, Glenn's been in Florida for 30, 40 years, and he knows he does a jillion MGs. And so all these questions that you've got about heat, he can better answer because he's right there in that same environment. Yeah, he's uh, in the north and west of me. Yeah. I had Tampa. Yeah, it's in Tampa, so it, it's uh, like a seven-hour drive. Yeah, but I go forty. I go forty minutes, and uh, the thing is starting to heat up. Yeah, well, call him on the phone and talk to him. Don't, don't, don't. I mean, he's he's a businessman, so maybe offer to compensate him for his time or something. But you know. Ask him, ask him some stuff to do. And you can always call me tomorrow. I'd be happy to talk to you some more about, about things you can do. But my Just, experience with other people is that the, the original two fans on there push more air than any, any other fan you can possibly ever buy. And if you get an aluminum radiator, those cool far more efficiently than the original radiators. I do have an aluminum on there. I, when I bought the car, I bought the car in February. Okay. Well, it shouldn't be. It shouldn't be heating up that much. Sometimes, sometimes the tune, the tune is bad, and and the timing is so far off that it's creating more heat than it can dissipate. I see. Okay. But sometimes it's just the temperature gauge. You're chasing a problem that doesn't actually exist. Sometimes the, the gauge is just wrong. Hey, so John. There's, there's lots of possibilities. Yeah, Jordan. Does the the voltage regulator for the gauges make it read hot or cold? I can't remember. I, I remember that was my problem with my gauge. When, reading it, when the voltage stabilizer fails, uh, the old ones, it usually fails um, in the way that is giving more voltage than it should. And so both the gas gauge and the, and the temp gauge read high. Now, sometimes oh, wow. people don't know that the gas gauge reads high till they run out of gas at an eighth of a tank or something. And if the sending unit's been changed, those specs are different than original. So that sometimes gets wonky. Almost all of the sending units, uh, the, the GTR 101s and the GTR 103s that go into the cylinder head, almost all of those have got the wrong resistance in them. So there's a lot of stuff that they can give you the indication that you're running too hot, but you're not. But may, you know, maybe are. The best thing you can get is one of those handheld, every, everybody, every, every yep. business in the world had those handheld pyrometers because they were shooting your forehead for two years during COVID. So those things are just the nuts and you can point it, open up the bonnet, point it right at the engine and see what the temperature is. And just nominally, you should be between 190 and 210, you know, around, around 195, 200 is best, but, um, it can get a little hotter than, than that. That's so, what I ended up doing with mine, but I'm not sure any of those ones for your forehead will get that hot because uh, oh. then you really got some problems. <laughs> okay. All right. All right. If, I could speak, if I could speak, I'm in Fort Lauderdale, 30 miles south of you in where in Boca and my A, I've removed the heater and I've actually been able to remove the control uh, inside in the dash as well because it's just plastic and and the pull uh, wires but there are folks who are uh, here who can help you too Gold Coast British Car Club um, for the A and T's and everything so just wanted to speak to that thank you uh, who, who, tell, tell me the, the name of your club again David Gold Coast British Car Club okay David you're yes, in for Plantation. Oh, plantation. Okay. Just uh, you're down the road for me off of uh, Sawgrass. Yeah. Can you text me your, your number? Uh, I will put it in the chat. Is that okay? 
That's fine. Perfect. I appreciate uh, it. Gold Coast. In the bottom. Yeah. Okay. Oh, thank you very much. Thanks. Okay. John, thank you again. Oh, hey, you're very welcome. Oh, boy. Steve, uh, Steve Illis, how do you remove the vents from the dash on my ADB? You mean the vertical vents that sit in the middle of the dash? Steve, are you still on? Yeah, those are the ones. Those are the ones. Well, it's not, it, it can't get too much more complicated or upside down and backwards. The glove box comes out. You reach in there and you take the two uh, plastic tubes that go between the, the, the firewall and, and those vents. Then you get a mirror back in there so you can see what's going on. And there's two nuts that you have to, to remove. And then you take those two nuts off and a bracket comes off and it, it comes out the front. Yeah, sounds like a really good time, yeah. It's, it's, a, it's a project. It's well, I really just wanted to take them out so I could clean them, but I think I'll figure out another way to clean them. Get those long, get those long cotton swabs. Yeah, that sounds, <laughs> that sounds for, good. I, I had a friend, this is uh, 40 years ago. I had this friend who's, who uh, spent all day all day cleaning his car and he spent an inordinate amount of time cleaning the, the fresh air vent is 73b harvest gold and um and it was, ju it was just perfectly clean and so he went to a party and and uh um i they were drinking and doing doing some uh doing some recreational drugs and so he had his wife drive home and partway home, he goes, stop, stop the car. But she couldn't pull over fast enough. And he threw up all into the fresh air vent and he just spent all day trying to clean. So he had to take his out because you can't, you know, you can't, <laughs> you can't. Yeah. oh, what a mess. Yeah. No, I, I haven't done anything close to that. I just wanted to get them cleaned up. I, I got it all detailed nicely and everything. And there's a yeah. lot of dust and junk inside. Yeah. Well, you know, you just you take the glove box out and then, and then you reach back in there and, and then, you know, the, the, uh, the vent tubes come off far more easily than they go back on. It's yeah. just tedious, just tedious. And then you get a mirror so you can, you know, look in there. You can't work in the mirror, but you can look in there and see what you're supposed to do. Then you got to use it like a deep three eight socket or something. Yeah, I, I think I'll just pass on that and use a, like you said, a long cotton swab. That'll work. Okay. Yeah. All right. Thank you, John. Okay. Okay. Let's see, John Fabry. If you're um, if you're putting the cotter pins in the front hubs on a wire wheel MGB, what is the proper technique such that you are able to get it back out most effectively the next time. Okay, so the, what are the tools of choice here? Um, so what I do is it is miserable. It's a miserable job. So there's one hole in most of the hubs, just one. And so you push the split pin through and then as you're holding it through, um, with with a punch, with a large diameter punch, holding it through, then you grab the other end of it that's ex extended out the other side of the castle nut with a pair of um, bird, um, um, needle nose pliers, heavy duty, but needle nose pliers, and you can you can bend, you can start to bend that up, and then you get a long screwdriver and put it down in there. And, and straighten it out just a little bit. You don't have to fold it over. You don't have to get so exotic. Um, and you can't get it tight. You know, you shouldn't put a split pin in unless, it, you, unless when it's folded, it's tight. There's no way you can make it tight. There just isn't, but it isn't gonna go anywhere because it's all gobbled with grease and everything. So hold it in place with, it, with the uh, punch, uh, pull it just a little bit with a pair of needle nose and then use a big screwdriver. To, uh, to, to catch the part that's there and, and bend, it, bend it up a little bit. And then when you go to put it back, all you have to do is unbend the part that you've bent up. And again, you're using that, that same great big long screwdriver and, and just tunking at it gently, so. Thanks, Dave. Yeah, where, where are you from, John? Uh, Cleveland, Tennessee, just a little northeast of Chattanooga. Okay. There's I'm a, going to solve the problem mostly by switching to a 
steel the steel wheels but oh yeah uh, well, it's easy oh my gosh, gosh. i mean I, I suffered so badly on the first one i was just you know because if you don't have a lift you're doing it down at you know belly height and all this stuff yeah and, you know i was sweating and swearing and you know i got it out and i was like that was all i did for you know one day's worth of work and i was just so pleased that when i got to the other the other side i don't even think it was tight in there and i just you know basically just had to push it out so you know i was rewarded that the second one came out easy but i kind of wondered if do you clip them off short or something like that just so that you know because the ability is even if you sort of get it straight you know trying to pull it back out is you can't get anything in to to grab the other side to you have to have some kind of hook you have to you, at least not, I mean, maybe not strong enough to pull it all the way out, but at least to hold it as, as far as you're, as you're pulling it. And then you use that big screwdriver on the other end of it and keep popping it out until it comes out. So yeah, the, the, tr the trick is don't, don't bend it all the way over and, yeah. and jam it tight because it just makes it so impossible to, to get. Yeah, certainly, certainly felt like most, in most cases, those things, they're not going to just straighten out and come out you know, <laughs> I, I oh, there, there, there we go. Pat, Pat's got his 90 degree uh, little hook there. So, so sometimes it's, uh, it's, it's hard to even get that onto it to start off yeah. with, but it's, yeah. it's just a crazy design. So it's, but you know, now, yeah, with, um, yeah, with, uh, going with Judd's suggestion of, uh, uh, getting rid of the wire. <laughs> you know, going at this wheel so you don't have that problem. I got to find some hubs for the back. That's the next step. I got some hubs for the front now. I got to get some hubs for the back, and then I got to deal with wheel spacers. But I got to find a pair of rear rear hubs for the. I, you know, you have to get these these studs that are like that long. Yeah. I mean, they're they're dramatically. I mean, well, they got to the studs. They have to be three quarters of an inch longer than they yeah. are now. That's, that was pretty common. I, I used to work for a place that did Mustang suspension. Oh, okay, all right. And wheels on and longer wheel studs was something that they, they sold all the time. So I, okay. I kinda, I'm, I'm familiar with those those parts of the problem. I, okay. just, I just need to get the, the rear hubs that fit yep. based on the shorter rear axle and stuff. But, yep, well, there, uh, Paul Dershaw, sports car craftsman. He, he, that guy's name comes up. He's not the only supplier. Um, uh, Bob and Gloria have, have got somebody that's closer to them. What, what's your place, Bob? That you, your team Triumph. Yeah, team Triumph in Warren, Ohio. He does mostly uh, uh, mail order. He's a Moss distributor, and he has two buildings full of used parts. Team Triumph, Warren, Ohio. So oh, they, you yeah, just yeah. And they, they, you shouldn't have to pay squat for them because there's so many extra ones out there. So, but. Yeah, that's what I was hoping for not having to pay, you know, through the nose for, yeah, for something I mean, like that, that basically I mean, doesn't go bad and you just 25 kind of bucks a piece kind of it's because they, they they don't go bad. Anyone who's got any MG parts at all has got an extra rear axle, I guess. Yeah, exactly. Seems like that. Okay. Thanks. All right, great. Great. Oh, here we go. Uh, Bob and Gloria, we replaced the lower pulley and the distributor went back to normal position for a short time. Then it went back to the same problem after a few backfires. It was a used pulley. Should I get a new one or could there be another problem? And that, and that all has to do with timing, right? We, about, we, we postulated that perhaps the timing mark had slipped on your pulley and that's why. Yeah. Um, when I put the other pulley, I was used, but when I put it on, the uh, dog leg went back to the clock where it's supposed to be, car started, had to walk away to do something else. I came back to time it. All of a sudden, it started backfiring through the carburetors, even popped the, the caps off, and it went back to the same place it was before. And or this is my old, I don't know if you can see it, my old pulley. It, it was it was it bad. Was, it, it was, was bad. It's got a, it's yucky. cracked up here. And so I got a used one. And uh, I don't know if it's bad pulley. Or I'm having another problem. But I put it. That's snapping and popping. I can't. That sounds like a bad condenser. <laughs> you know. I mean. You know. So. But, but I have a um, a crane. Oh, okay. All right. But and well, I had another problem. And it, it, when I put it all together at first, I got no spark. Got spark out of the coil. Nothing out of the plug. Away. Just that little short brown wire inside the distributor. inside the distributor. <laughs> little brown wire. 
it was barely hanging on by a thread. I think it was like one wire <laughs> that it was. So I we, we cut it, put it back, and the car ran great. And I went to time it, and um, it just started backfiring. And so I don't know. If, and I'm back to uh, to five o'clock on the dog leg. So I'm thinking maybe that use pulley wasn't all that wise. I don't know. Show show me that that pulley again. Um, I don't know if you can put see the it. put put the key weight put the key weight at twelve o'clock. Yep. Okay. And wh where's the timing over, mark? Over here. The timing mark should be over here, but it's pretty. Yeah, okay. Hard. All right. Oh yeah, that that looks pretty beat up. Um, you know, just yeah. So I got one from Scott, and uh, he stands behind this stuff, but I. I don't want to go get another used one, and I, I, if there's another problem, it was a lot of work. <laughs> probably another problem. Probably another problem because that's that's too bizarre that you would have the same problem. And I, I timed it with the distributor way over to the right. Mm -hmm. It just runs like a top. I I cranked it up on the freeway up to 5500. I took it to 80, 85, and just ran really great. Just the distributors in the wrong place, but. You, you can't see that where you're driving it anyhow. <laughs> no. So I, I don't, uh, it just seemed like there'd be another problem. Uh, I'll talk, I'll keep talking to you about it. Yeah, okay. I, I was going to call you. I didn't want to take a lot of time tonight to discuss it. But uh, other than that, the car just <laughs> runs great. Well, we're about at 930. We're not quite at 930. So we're half an hour over our time. I, I, uh, I, I just, I got 17 more messages here. I, um, oh, Ron D, why don't you write a book? Ron D, why don't you come to my house and follow me around? I, I've got Marty. Marty's supposed to be helping me write my book. So it's, it's, uh, it's, yeah, there's, I, I, I'm, that, that is my, my, uh, publicly stated num number one function, but, uh, I know today, let's see, my kids were here and then at two o'clock, my sister showed up and then I had to go out to my, my uh, late son's widow's house and pick up some boxes. And so it didn't get done today and I got Zoom tonight. So it didn't get done today. <laughs> it's, it's hard to, and I got, I got some projects in the shop and, and uh, the most patient MG owners in the world. And, and uh, uh, anyway, so it's on my mind every day. Ron. So anyway. All right. Well, anyway, hey, I, th I think we're going to um, 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 take a take a well well deserved uh, break here until what's the date? Uh, 725. 725. So in two weeks, we can have another Zoom session. I'll, I'll see if I can't get somebody else uh, um, to come in and talk about something something more exciting. I don't know. I don't know about body work, but or recovering seats may, I don't know. I'll, I'll see if I can get somebody else on the line to, uh, to make it more exciting than just listening to me drone on. So anyway, I want to thank everybody for being here tonight and for participating. Um, and again, if you have questions that you didn't, that I didn't get to tonight, you can call me tomorrow. I'm happy to answer them. And and uh, use uh, use your local clubs, the Gold Coast Gold Coast Club in Florida. You know, just a couple yeah. miles away. Uh, what a handy resource! And Barney Gaylord's got that wonderful MGA Guru site, and it isn't just MGA stuff. Mostly, mostly MGA stuff, but a lot of this stuff transfers over to MGB. And he also has a list of of um, all the shops that are around. And I think the clubs that are around. So there's a lot of information out there. This is a this is a, a hobby in which you do not have to reinvent the wheel. It doesn't matter what you're doing, whether you're you're, you're getting that that um, grinding growling noise that comes up from the steering when you're on the off ramp, or you're trying to take your heater motor out in Florida. Um, somebody's already done it. Somebody's already done it and talked about it and the information's out there someplace. So use all the resources you can, knowledge is power. So I wanna thank everybody for being on tonight and I'm, I'm, uh, you can unmute yourself and we can have a minute or two of uh, 
salutations and and then it'll be it'll then it'll be tomorrow and then it'll be two weeks from now and we'll continue on and maybe greg greg can get a new picture and or if, if he's got anything more done underneath the bonnet on his blue card there so all right thanks john see everybody it's a pleasure yeah, Phil yeah. Ryan, nice to see you. Sean, yeah. pleasure to see you on tonight. <clears throat> Always good to see you, John. Good to be seen, John. Hey, Thanks. yeah, and better than the alternative. Yeah. <laughs> so, better be seen than viewed. Yeah. And so, we're always happy to see your same old mug on there. Oh, Alan, yeah, hey, you know. <laughs> so thanks for your contributions. It's very kind. You know, it's a 30 year old pursuing this habit. What's that? We need to get some 30 year olds pursuing this habit. Everybody on here is everybody on here is white hair. <laughs> a 30 year old. Well, 30 year old, a 30 so, year old. Not, to work. not quite. Well, it, all right. So let's 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 plan for a, if, if as long as we're asking for something we can't get, what what we ask for um, 30 year old attractive girls. You know, how come, how come this isn't a thing for 30 year old attractive girls, huh? So <laughs> let's wish, wish, wish for heaven. So they're all busy on TikTok. <laughs> yeah. What, yeah, what was tonight's official I, count? I was, oh, I don't know. I don't know what the official count was. I missed it. 141 at one point. 141 and 143. Oh, my. All right. 143. One, Great. I was talking to my daughter and I said, well, what about, you know, we're talking about doing these kinds of seminars. And I, and I said, well, what about OnlyFans? And she, she said, no, that's probably not a good site to, to use for, for uh, MG stuff. So. <laughs> <laughs> she, although she probably said it more emphatically than that. So. <laughs> hey, Robert Davidson, where, where's, the, where's the meeting tomorrow night? You're muted. You're muted, Robert. No, you're still muted, Robert. I can't. I can't hear a word you're saying. There. I don't know. I don't know why you're muted. All right. Too bad. He's um, open now. Yeah. Well, it looks like it. But no, not nothing, Scott. I'll I'll just go online and look. We got a club meeting. Tom Snook, pleasure to see you. Steve Shivington, pleasure to see you. You're doing all right, Steve. Yeah, yeah. Follow up surgeries tomorrow. Oh boy! Oh boy! Yeah. Follow up, follow up surgery. Right. Oh, They're going oh back in. Make sure they got it. Right. Oh my gosh! Oh <laughs> my gosh. Well, good luck to you. Oh my yeah. Gosh. yeah. I'll keep you in the loop. Thanks. All right. Yeah. You're, you're still up, Steve. I'm going to give you a call. Okay. Right. Ron Nugent, pleasure to see you. So, all right. Well, we're down to thir 33 people, and and uh, oh my gosh, well. It's, yeah. Anyway, so anyway, thanks, Tony. It's a pleasure to see you. See your daughters up there in, in Canada. And, and uh, anyway, I enjoyed seeing you. Yeah. Well, to all a good night. Good night, good night, John. John. Good night, 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 John.